The story begins as Lin Mu sits in class and Du Xiaoyu approaches him. Reflecting on his school life, he considers himself a gloomy boy often looked down upon by his beautiful fiancée. She remarks on his perceived uselessness. The scene transitions to Lin Mu standing on the roof of his house, contemplating the greed of his family members, eyeing an inheritance that isn't even his yet. Suddenly, his second uncle, Lin Yifu, appears and tells him to go to hell before pushing him from the roof. He says, don't blame him. Blame the older man for thinking so highly of him. Falling to the ground unconscious and bleeding, he reflects on how his parents passed away early, leaving him on his own. He has been transferred to the hospital and lies unconsciously, thinking he has already given up all hope in the world and has lost the will to survive. In the end, he passes away. Dr. Zhuo stands near him and states that the patient has lost all vital signs and is pronounced dead from a medical point of view. His body is enveloped in some magical light. He thinks, however, that as fate would have it, a time-traveling soul has found him and is continuing to write his unfinished story. He believes that Kang Kunzi, the best cultivator in the world of immortal cultivation, whose death had been plotted, entered his body, and he returned to campus as Lin Mu. The scene shifts to Lin Mu standing with Du Xiaoyu. She states that trash will always be trash, and she will never fulfill their marriage contract. He asserts that he would not marry her even if she begged him. The scene shifts as he no longer considers running away. The yellow-haired boy teases him asking if he is trying to make a fool out of him and whether he is not scared of what will be done to him. Lin Mu grabs his shirt and they both engage in a fight. He beats him on the floor, stating that if he continues bothering him, he will destroy himself. The scene shifts and he reflects that afterwards he was invited to join the mysterious and powerful Bao Long organization. Tang Beibei inquires if he intends to join the Bao Long organization. Reflecting on his first mission, he quickly knocks down the enemy. He explains that he got to know Luo Bingyun, the eldest daughter of an overseas Chinese family, and shared a villa with Song Yuru, a beautiful counselor. He rescued Wang Ziking, a policewoman who was in danger. He then explains that he married the famous and beautiful Jai Kinglanu under contract. However, things did not always go as planned. Second, Uncle Lin Yifu says that such a narrow-minded person will never be successful and advises him to listen to Grandpa and let him go. Lin Mu thinks that faced with doubts, he rose to the challenge and vowed to regain the undefeatable strength of being the best in the cultivation world. He says to watch out as they will all crawl under his feet one day. The story begins in the academic block of Donghai University. Lin Bu sits at his desk, working on some homework, and wonders why it is so difficult. Just then, Du Xiaoyu arrives with her girl gang. A boy from the class asks if the girl in front is not freshman Du Xiaoyu. The other boy says she is so beautiful. No wonder she was named the Belle of Donghai University as soon as she started school here. He comments on her beauty and questions why she is at their university, suggesting she should attend a university offering film and television studies. He wonders if she does not want to be an actress. He mentions that this is an open class for second-year students and questions what freshmen are doing here. A red-haired girl asks Du Xiaoyu if that is not the guy she has a marriage contract with, saying he does not seem that impressive. She adds that even if she stays single forever, she will never marry someone like him. The red-haired girl approaches Lin Mu's desk and states that they want to sit there, asking why he doesn't move to the back. He questions if there are not a lot of empty seats. She insists they want to sit there, criticizing him for refusing to sit in the first row when he can't even do simple calculus. She advises him to stop being so oblivious and find a corner to sit in where he won't bother anyone. His classmates tell him that the beauty has already spoken, asking why he didn't move to another seat and stop getting in their way. Lin Mu packed his bag and drove away. The red-haired girl remarks, so useless. The red-haired girl then asks how someone like him could be admitted to Donghai University and if he pulled some strings. Du Xiaoyu says that as long as his engagement with Lin Mu is cancelled, she does not care where he studies. 
After a while, Lin Mu stands at the bus stop and recalls Du Ziyoyu calling him useless. He acknowledges that the seniors of their two families set up the marriage contract, and it's not his fault. He then decides to forget it, stating that he will go home and visit Grandpa first. He takes a taxi, wondering if he is getting better. After a while, at the Lin family mansion, Lin Mu enters the home and greets Grandpa, saying he is home. He hears voices, thinks it sounds like his uncle and aunt are here, and wonders if they are arguing. He remarks that everyone is present. His aunt Lin Rong acknowledges that he is home and informs him that his grandpa is at the hospital for a checkup but will return soon. Lin Mu says he sees and mentions that he will be in his room, then quietly walks toward his room. His eldest uncle, Lin Yida, comments that this little brat is getting more unruly as he does not even greet his elders. His second uncle, Lin Yifu, asks why he still cares about that and says he will be dead soon anyway. After a while at dinner time, Lin Mu comes to his grandpa and informs him that he is on break for the next two days so he can spend time with him. His grandpa agrees, saying okay sure. Lin Mu mentions that since mom and dad passed away, grandpa has been like this and he does not know if he will get better. His aunt Lin Rong suggests they eat, to which he replies, all right. They all sit at the dinner table, and Uncle Lin Yida says there will be an event for the auction at their house soon. Since he has not officially taken over the auction, it's a little inconvenient to manage certain things himself. He suggests handing it over and letting him control the auction. Uncle Lin Yifu adds that since it's so problematic, he should let it go and share the auction burden with him. Lin Mu stands up and says he is complete, then mentions he will be in his room and leaves. Uncle Lin Yutai inquires about handing it over to him, stating that he has done so much for the auction house and questions why he should give it to him. Uncle Lin Yifu questions who he thinks he is to take over the auction house himself and advises him to remember his place and stop his wishful thinking. On the other side, Lin Mu goes to the rooftop and reflects, saying, Dad, Mom, they left too early. He can't see how the Lin family is falling apart. Just then, Uncle Lin Yifu arrives and asks if he is thinking about his parents again. Lin Mu asks how he can help him. He responds that there's nothing. He just noticed he returned to his room without even having dinner. He came to check on him because he was afraid that he was upset. Lin Mu thanks him for his concern, but assures him he is okay. He says among the four siblings, his father was the only one as skilled as the older man. He mentions that it's a pity that his father was so obsessed with knowledge, spending all his time studying antiques. The Lin family is prominent, and the older man is a traditional person. He notes that his father insisted on taking over the family. Sadly, he suffered too many losses during his time as the head of the family. He suggests not dwelling on the past, mentioning that he is there to tell him something, and emphasizes that they should never do anything beyond their ability, as things will quickly get out of control. Lin Mu asks what he is talking about. Uncle Lin Yifu pushes him from the roof, and he falls to the ground bleeding. He explains that what he is trying to say is that he is letting him reunite with his parents. He announces that Lin Mu fell. Meanwhile, in the doctor's office, Dr. Zhu sits in his office, and a nurse quickly enters his room, informing him that a patient who fell from a building has just been admitted to the emergency room. The situation is urgent, and the director asks her to hurry over. She responds, saying all right, she will be there immediately. Meanwhile, the doctor attempts to treat Lin Mu in the emergency room. Dr. Zhu arrives and inquires about the patient's condition. The doctor explains that the patient fell from the fourth floor, hitting his head on the steps, resulting in hemorrhaging and a severe fracture to his skull. The situation is critical. He says he knows she is proficient in acupuncture and Chinese medicinal therapy and asks if there is any way to relieve the patient's condition. She acknowledges that there are ways, but the risks are high. He understands and emphasizes the importance of the patient's survival. She agrees, saying all right, and starts the treatment by putting needles in his head. A lady doctor reports that the patient's vital signs have stabilized. 
Dr. Zhu mentions that she has used the silver needles to stimulate the patient's vitals, but being in his state for a long time can lead to death, and the rest is up to him. The other doctor instructs everyone to hurry and continue with the emergency rescue. She notes that the patient's Iki signal is still unstable. He questions why it is not working and instructs her to prepare the defibrillator. He specifies that the defibrillator is set at 200J. When it still does not work, he adjusts the defibrillator to 300J. He observes that the vital signs have returned to zero, indicating they have failed to rescue the patient. Dr. Zhu instructs them to go and notify the patient's family. The lady doctor acknowledges and covers Lin Mu's face, and they all leave from there. A black magic soul appears on his lifeless body. The magical soul enters his lifeless body, and he starts to levitate into the air, with a ring appearing on his finger. The next morning, Dr. Zhu stands outside his office, hearing the screams of nurses. He rushes toward the room and asks what happened. The nurse says they don't know what's going on, and it's terrifying. She is shocked to see Lin Mu's body and asks if he grew taller overnight. Upon checking, she remarks that it's strange because his body is warm. Lin Mu opens his eyes, surprising everyone. A nurse exclaims that the dead body is moving. Dr. Zhu instructs them to be quiet and reminds them that, as medical staff, it would be best if they remained calm. He speculates that the patient was probably in a state of suspended animation before. Lin Mu then asks who she is, where he is, and who he is. After a while, she transfers him to the intensive care unit and asks if he lost his memory because of her silver needle acupuncture as he can't even remember his name. She assures him not to worry as he will be able to remember it after a while. She places a button near him and mentions that she has something else she needs to take care of. She informs him that if he needs anything, he should press this button and a nurse will come over. She then leaves the room. Lin Mu opens his eyes and mentions that he can hardly feel any spiritual Kai. He asks where exactly he is and remarks that his body is extremely weak. He explains that he had to use the last of the ninth stage Real Calamity's spiritual Kai to create this body, otherwise he might have lost an unimaginable amount of soul power. Lin Mu reflects that he never imagined that he, the best cultivator in the world of immortal cultivation, would end up like this. He declares that when he, Kang Kunzi, returns to the world of immortal cultivation, he will kill every single member of Xuan Tian sect and Yugui sect who have become arrogant. Meanwhile, at Lin Mansion, Uncle Lin Yifu receives a call from the hospital and questions what is going on in that hospital. He mentions that a minute ago, they told him that his nephew was dead, and now they are saying he's come back to life. He asks for an explanation, and the caller mentions that he came back to life, but has lost his memory. Uncle Lin Yifu responds, telling them to thank him for the update, to take good care of his nephew, and that the medical bills are not a problem. Aunt Lin Rong asks what happened and how he is suddenly alive again after they say he is dead. He replies that he does not know and mentions that the hospital called just now to inform him that, although the boy survived, he has completely lost his memory. She questions if he is an idiot now, and he clarifies that losing one's memory doesn't make someone an idiot. She asks what they should do now and if they should change the original plan. He suggests that she has a rather good relationship with that kid, so she should visit the hospital and check on him first. He adds that he won't show up until he is certain of the situation. He instructs her to observe whether he has completely lost his memory. After a while, in the intensive care unit, Lin Mu is seated when someone knocks on the door. He says, come in. Dr. Zhu, accompanied by Aunt Lin Rong, enters and informs Lin Mu that someone is here to see him. She asks if Lin Mu remembers her. Lin Mu responds that, with his current condition, he can't remember anyone. Aunt Lin Rong identifies herself as his aunt and asks if he really does not remember her. Lin Mu apologizes, stating that he really does not remember. She tells him not to force himself and emphasizes the importance of taking good care of himself. She will visit him often. Aunt Lin Rong then asks Dr. Zhu why her nephew looked different before he was injured. 
Dr. Zhu explains that when he fell to the ground, he injured his face, so they had to perform minimally invasive surgery, resulting in a slightly different appearance. Aunt Lin Rong thanks her for all her help and requests her to continue looking after him while he's still in the hospital. She reflects that it seems like he really lost his memory. The scene shifts and Lin Mu sits in the intensive care unit. He notices a file and remarks that human civilization in this world is 5,000 years old. He questions how the spiritual Kai can be so thin, stating that it's almost impossible to feel it. He expresses that he has learned a lot from this book. Dr. Zhu mentions that now that he has almost recovered from his injuries, he can go through the discharge procedures. Lin Mu responds with an okay and thanks her for taking care of him. She asks where he learned such an ancient gesture. He laughs and admits that she caught him, mentioning that he is quite interested in ancient traditions. Dr. Zhu then wished him good luck with the hospital discharge and advised him to spend more time with his family and friends once he returned, as it would help restore his memory. He walks away from there, takes a taxi, and remarks that although the spiritual Kai of this world is exhausted, it has not hindered the development of society, which is definitely not easy. After a while, he arrives at the university. The taxi driver informs him that the fare is 50 yuan. He apologizes, stating that he just got out of the hospital and forgot that he had no money with him. He insists that he is a Donghai University student and denies attempting to cheat on his cab fare. He clarifies that he is not trying to cheat the driver and genuinely does not bring any money with him. The driver suggests that if that's the case, why doesn't he call one of his classmates to come help him out? Lin Mu contemplates what he should do, but realizes that he does not know any of them. Tang Bebe approaches a taxi and mentions that it's been so long. Lin Mu explains that he came to school as soon as he was discharged from the hospital, so he does not have any money. She assures him not to worry and says she can help him. She then inquires if he was hospitalized for plastic surgery. Lin Mu asks if she can lend him the money first and promises to explain everything afterwards. As they both start walking, Lin Mu begins to explain that he fell. She asks if he fell from a building, lost his memory, and now doesn't remember anyone. She asks if that means he does not remember her. Lin Mu confirms, saying he is sorry, but he does not remember her. She questions what the doctor said and if there is any chance of recovery. He replies that he does not know. She reflects, saying that, come to think of it, losing his memory might be a good thing for him. She adds that sometimes, she wishes she had amnesia too. Just then, Du Zaiyu arrives with her girls, looks at him, and asks if he took time off for plastic surgery. He responds that he did not. Tang Bebe comments that even if he did, he looks quite handsome. Du Zaiyu asks if he thinks she'd fulfill their marriage contract just because he had cosmetic surgery. She states that trash will always be trash. Lin Mu thinks it seems like the original owner of this body had a marriage contract with her. He states that he would not marry her even if she begged him. She gets angry. He tells her to take a look at herself and asks if she thinks he wants to marry someone like her. She asks how dare he. He informs her that the marriage contract is cancelled as she wanted, and he hopes she won't bother him anymore. Tang Bebe remarks that he is amazing. He says goodbye to Du Zaiyu and moves forward. She comments that he finally stood up for himself and vented his frustrations. He asks if he was weak and if he was bullied. She responds that he was not just bullied, he was an embarrassment to men. He clarifies that she just wanted to force him to break off the marriage, and if that's the case, he did not let her get her way too easily. She asks what if he breaks off the marriage contract and says there's nothing special about that woman. She asks if he regrets it and says after all, she's the campus belle. He says of course not, he regrets letting her off the hook so easily. She says all right, stay away from her in the future and follow her she will reintroduce him to their classmates. They enter the class, and a dart is about to hit Tang Bebe, but she grabs it before it hits. She asks Chen how how many times he has been told he is not allowed to play darts in the classroom, and what if he hits someone. Chen Hao thinks it's over. 
he has made Tang Bebe angry and says he is sorry he won't do it again. She says to look at him, trying to show off even though his skills are horrible, and asks if he is not embarrassed. She throws the dart, and it hits the card center. Lin Mu thinks this accuracy is considered the standard of the foundation phase middle stage sensitive realm, and it seems like this world is full of surprises. She says everyone, let her reintroduce him to their classmate, this is Lin Mu. She explains that, as they know, Lin Mu was injured and has been hospitalized for some time. His external injuries have healed, but he has lost his memory. She hopes everyone can be understanding and do their best to help him regain his memory. Lin Mu thinks she is amazing and pretty popular. Just then, their counselor, Miss Song Yuru, knocks at the door, enters the room, and asks if she missed something. Lin Mu inquires if she is also a classmate of theirs. Tang Bebe informs her that their counselor is Ms. Song Yuru. Lin Mu acknowledges this, and Miss Song Yuru confirms that he has finally been discharged from the hospital and should accompany her to the office. Tang Bebe questions why he is still standing there and suggests that he go to the office with Ms. Song. After a while, in the office, Miss. Song Yuru mentioned that she had heard about what happened and inquired if his injuries had all healed. He expresses gratitude for her concern, stating that he is recovering well. She remarks that it's good, and if he needs any help, he can approach her anytime without worrying about troubling her. He agrees, saying okay sure. Tang Bebe arrives at the office and asks if she is interrupting. She informs them that Lin Mu and she plan to have lunch together and that she is going to show him around the campus. Ms. Song Yuru assures her that she is not interrupting and encourages them to go ahead, expressing gratitude for the help. Tang Bebe responds with, don't mention it. After all, they are classmates. They leave the office. Ms. Song Yuru reflects, wondering if Lin Mu looked like this before. Not only has his appearance changed, but even his temperament seems different. After a while, they both walk around and Lin Mu observes, judging from the way she threw the dart earlier, she must practice often. He remarks that, compared to her family's training, that's just a small trick. He expresses his interest in training as well, and she suggests letting her see that his body is much stronger now than before the injury. She notes that it's as if he has undergone a long period of intense training and asks if this is a benefit he gains from falling off a building. He explains that he almost died when he fell, and the price is definitely too high if that's all he got in return. She agrees, saying he is right, and it would not be worth it if he actually died. He cautions her not to get any ideas, to which she responds that she isn't and just wants to ask about his plans for the future. He states that he did not even think about it, and he cannot even remember what he wanted to do. She inquires if he wants to try living another life. He questions the idea of another life. She explains that in the past, he was introverted and did not know how to stand up for himself, and that's why Du Zioyu bullied him. She adds that he has completely changed, not only in appearance but also in character. She believes this is a God-given opportunity for him to transform his life and otherwise, why would he have this extraordinary physique? She suggests taking advantage of this opportunity and giving it a try. He asks what he should do. She inquires if he has heard of the Bao Long organization. He inquires about the Bao Long organization. She suggests that before she tells him about the Bao Long organization, she should explain the realms of martial arts. She asks if he believes some masters can injure their enemies with just a petal or a leaf. He thinks she might be referring to the infusion of spiritual power. He acknowledges that he does and asks if a master like that still exists in this post-martial art period. She explains that it's not easy to achieve that level of mastery, so they are extremely hard to find. According to legend, she says, those masters have reached the innate realm, and her grandfather was once close to reaching that level. Unfortunately, he became obsessed with practice, and over time, his lifelong skills were destroyed before his eyes. She mentions that he was lucky he survived. He tells her not to be sad and asks if the fact that he lived is not the most important thing. She confirms that it's true. 
Now their Tang family has a few juniors who are amazingly gifted, and they hope to reach the innate realm with her grandfather personally guiding them in their cultivation. The Tang family anticipates finding success sooner or later. He asks if it is the one from Sichuan. She laughs and says he must be thinking of the Tang family often mentioned in martial arts novels. However, she notes that the Tang family does not only exist in novels, they are the unrivaled Sichuan Tang family of legend, and they even possess poisons and hidden weapons. She adds that at their peak, they had several innate masters who could eliminate anyone and remain unnoticed. He asks on what level these innate masters are. She says, according to his grandfather, all the martial arts they learned were created by them. He inquires if such a master has found the Bao Long organization. He contemplates that it seems the so-called innate realm is when someone has broken through the foundation phase. She clarifies that of course the Bao Long organization was not created by the Huaxia government to deal with some special cases. She explains that some sects will send newcomers there for training to quickly break through their barriers. He remarks that he is not in a sect, nor does he have any connections, and asks if he can join. He asserts that of course with his physique and some proper training, he will definitely be better than an average rookie. She inquires if he is willing to join the Bao Long organization. He affirms that yes, he wants to change his life. The scene shifts tonight on the Soaring Dragon Group's side, with Lin Mu and Tang Beibei walking. He mentions that the Bao Long organization's base is actually in the city center. She responds, saying of course they work with the government, and asks if they are supposed to hide out in the countryside. She adds that if something were to happen, they would be too late by the time they arrive. He agrees, saying that she is right. They both enter the elevator, and Lin Mu asks if this is the building for her base. She swipes her card, and a secret system appears in the elevator. She mentions that the Soaring Dragon Group is just a disguise and instructs him to observe. He asks what's going on and if the elevator is going down. The elevator stops, and she reveals that this is the real base of the Bao Long organization. After a while, inside the Bao Long organization, Yang, Tang Beibei's uncle, sits and remarks that it's the middle of the night, asking what brings her here. Lin Mu observes that this person is overflowing with divine light. He should have already broken through the foundation phase and reached the Kai Gathering Realm, However, he's still far from the innate realm. She explains that she has brought him a martial arts prodigy. Uncle Yang questions if she is bringing her boyfriend to meet the elders, asserting that she doesn't need to pull his leg. Besides, he's too old to start practicing martial arts. She clarifies that he is not her boyfriend, and if he doesn't believe her, he can check him out himself. He agrees and says he will see what he's like. He approaches Lin Mu, touches his shoulder, and expresses disbelief, stating that it's not possible. He states Lin Mu has an excellent foundation, but he's never practiced martial arts before. She reiterates that she told him so. Lin Mu, formerly an ordinary person, changed after falling from a building. He inquires if someone can really change that much. Lin Mu confirms that it's true. He underwent detailed testing in the hospital but still could not find the reason. He acknowledges that since Tang Beibei brought him here, she must have also introduced the Bao Long organization and asks if he has decided to join the Bao Long organization. Lin Mu affirms and says yes. He warns that before joining them, he needs to pass a test. Once he joins the Bao Long organization, it will be difficult for him to leave and asks if he is aware of this. Lin Mu responds that Tang Beibei had already told him all about it before coming here, and he is certain that he wants to join the Bao Long organization. He expresses approval, stating that he will arrange his admission test, and with his qualifications, it should not be a problem. He notes that he has such a good foundation, and it would be a pity if he did not practice martial arts. He handed him a book and explained that this book on breathing techniques is the best for laying the foundation. He instructs him to burn the book immediately after memorizing the content, emphasizing that he can't share this information with anyone else. He adds that as for martial arts moves, he can learn from him after mastering the breathing techniques. Lin Mu expresses his gratitude. 
She then mentions that she will take Lin Mu to the test first. Uncle Young approves, saying, all right, go ahead. After they leave, he remarks that Tang Bebe brought a wonderful gift and his East Sea Division will soon have an expert. After a while, in a dormitory, Lin Mu sits in his room reading a book. He reflects on why Lu Xiaoyang's breathing was unsteady, realizing it was the thin spiritual Kai of the earth. He notices some black magic waves around his ring and wonders if this ancient celestial ring will ever be anything more than storage. He decides to forget about it and notes that it's almost dawn, so he should visit the library and learn more about this world. The scene shifts to Lin Mu sitting in the library and reading the book. He overhears Du Xiaoyu arguing with Wang Dong. She warns him to leave her alone, stating that just because his family is rich, he shouldn't think he can show off and questions who he thinks she is. Wang Dong asks if being with him is not embarrassing and says they are both the heirs of their families, making them a good match. She questions if he is serious and if he really thinks he will inherit the Wang family, then starts to walk away. He tells her not to go and asks if she is rejecting him because she is arranged to marry into the Lin family. He adds that he heard her fiancé is useless and questions how someone like that can be worthy of her. He approaches Lin Mu and asks how he is, but Lin Mu does not reply. He remarks that Lin Mu is actually ignoring him and questions if he is deaf, stating that he is talking to him. Lin Mu asks if they know each other and if he can help him. He explains that he heard about Lin Mu's marriage contract with Du Xiaoyu and wanted to tell him to call it off immediately. Lin Mu responds that he has already broken off their marriage contract and her affairs have nothing to do with him anymore, so he should stop bothering him. He questions if it's really Du Xiaoyu. Du Xiaoyu denies it, saying it's not true. Wang Dong grabs Lin Mu's book, throws it away, accuses him of lying, and threatens to show him what happens to people who disrespect him. Lin Mu grabs his shirt, and Wang Dong asks what he is doing. Lin Mu beats him to the ground, puts his foot on his chest, and asks Du Xiaoyu if she still wants to continue with the engagement. She responds, of course not, but no matter what, it was arranged by their families. She adds that if they want to end their engagement, they have to do it formally. Just saying it like he did yesterday does not count. He expresses frustration, stating it's a pain, and informs Wang Dong that he heard everything. Lin Mu points out that she is still technically his fiance, so Wang Dong should stay away and asks if he understands. Wang Dong questions if Lin Mu knows who he is. Lin Mu defends himself by hitting Wang Dong's foot with his arm and asserts that he doesn't give a damn about who he is, answering his question. Wang Dong reluctantly agrees, saying he will leave immediately. He stands up, moves to leave, and says he is doomed. The librarian arrives and inquires about the loud noise, reminding them that they are in a library. Lin Mu explains that a student was running too fast and accidentally knocked over the desk and chair. He states that he will pick up the table and chair now. Du Xiaoyu comments that he has changed and wasn't like this before. Lin Mu suggests that maybe it's better this way, he will be able to stay out of trouble. She warns him that Wang Dong is a petty person and won't let this go, so he has to be careful. He acknowledges her warning and says thanks. Lin Mu sees his book, picks it up, and mentions that since he is done learning the breathing technique, it's time to learn something new from Lu Xiaoyang and think about solving the root of the problem. After a while, at the Wang residence, Wang Junli throws a file on the guard's face and exclaims, what a bunch of good-for-nothings. He expresses frustration, stating it's been a week, and this is all he has found. He complains that he spent so much taking care of him and Lin Mu is making a fool out of him. He questions how a timid person could break Wang Dong's arm if he claimed Lin Mu was timid. The guard insists it's the truth and Lin Mu was not like this before. Wang Junli demands an explanation. The guard explains that they bribed a Lin family servant and according to her, Lin Mu was really timid. However, after his accidental fall, he lost his memory and became the way he is now. He also mentions that Lin Mu does not visit home often anymore. Wang Junli instructs him to bring Lin Mu to him, and the guard agrees. 
Wang Junli asserts that Lin Mu shouldn't think he is safe just because he is from the Lin family. He warns that if Lin Mu provokes him, Wang Junli, he will torture him mercilessly. Meanwhile, Lin Mu is on his way somewhere when a vehicle stops in front of him. Some boys come out and inquire if he is Lin Mu. Lin Mu asks who's asking. The man with glasses informs him that their master is inviting him over for a chat. Lin Mu responds that he does not know his master. The man urges him not to waste any time and states that if he does not want to suffer, he should follow them. Lin Mu agrees, saying alright, let's go. He sits in the car with them and wonders if the Wan family is petty enough to seek revenge. He reflects on the coincidence that it seems they are. The scene shifts as a guard informs Wang Junli that the person he wants is downstairs. Wang Junli instructs him to bring him up. After a while, they arrive with Lin Mu. Wang Junli questions if he knows what he has done. Lin Mu replies that he does not. Wang Junli reveals that Wang Dong is his son. Lin Mu dismisses it, asking if Wang Junli is just seeking revenge for his son. Wang Junli laughs and commends Lin Mu for speaking to him like that. Out of respect for old master Lin, he states that he won't be too hard on him, just break the tendons in his hands and leave. Lin Mu questions what if he does not want to comply. The guard holds him from the shoulder and advises him not to be difficult. Lin Mu punches him, saying not to touch him, and knocks him out. Wang Junli commends him, stating it's not bad, and asks if he can handle a group of people. The guards surround him, but he smiles. Wang Junli praises him, remarking that he can still smile at a time like this, and acknowledges that it's true that children know no fear. He orders them to finish him. Lin Mu suggests they attack him all at once as he is in a hurry and wants to save some time to talk to his boss after dealing with him. Lin Mu says come on and starts fighting with them. About 10 seconds later, he knocks all the guards out. Wang Junli questions how that's possible. Lin Mu suggests they talk, noting that he and his son have wasted a lot of his time. He asks how Wang Junli is going to compensate him. Wang Junli claims it's his son's fault and proposes transferring 20 million to him as compensation. Lin Mu questions if it is dirty money. Wang Junli denies it, asserting that it's legal and absolutely safe. He gives his card and agrees, telling him to transfer it to this card. Wang Junli says okay, and he will do it now. He requests to use the computer at his desk over there. He transfers the money and states that it's done, and the money has been transferred. He suggests Lin Mu check if the amount is correct. Lin Mu thanks him and says if there's nothing else, he will head out. Wang Junli insists there's no need to rush, takes out a gun, and asks why they don't talk. Wang Junli asks if the cat got his tongue, questioning if he wasn't threatening before. Lin Mu smiles, kicks the table, and hits Wang Junli, causing him to fall behind. He asks why he did that, and he responds that it was a misunderstanding. He really just wanted to talk with him. Lin Mu asserts that they have nothing to talk about and warns that he could easily kill him so Wang Junli shouldn't test his patience. Wang Junli admits he was wrong, stating that the Wang and Lin families are friends, and there's no need to make things worse. He adds that in the future if Lin Mu needs anything, he won't refuse. Lin Mu questions if that's so and says it's great if he really thinks that way. He grabs Wang Junli's neck and puts a pill in his mouth. Wang Junli asks what it was. Lin Mu explains that he doesn't believe him, so he feeds him a seizure-triggering poison, and if he behaves, he will give him an antidote once every three months. Otherwise, he will wish he was dead. He moves to leave and says to consider it a warning. Just then, Lin Mu's phone rings, and he receives a call from Tang Bebe. She informs him to return to base, there is a mission. After a while, everyone gathers at Soaring Dragon Group. Lin Mu asks Tang Bebe what happened and why everyone has gathered here so suddenly. She explains that earlier, the leader of a group of mercenaries was arrested in China, and his men took more than a dozen hostages while trying to save him. They threatened the government to release their leader, and the situation was out of their control. 
She adds that not only are they taking hostages, but they are also eyeing the Pearl Tower, and they have to stop them before they act. Lin Mu asks if there is a plan. She replies that their mission is to rescue the hostages and assist other departments in their operations. Lin Mu questions if the rescue is an operation for just the two of them. She clarifies that of course not. If it were not for the lack of manpower, they would not have called a newcomer like him here. She instructs him to find out the location of the hostages and then inform the accompanying seniors. An Li Yang states that this mission is extremely important and he believes everyone is aware of the details, so he won't say more. He then starts the operation. After a while, in Pingyong District, Donghai City, Lin Mu attempts to enter a place secretly, sensing that something is strange. He observes many people inside, though the room appears empty. Jumping down near a window, he contemplates the situation. Discovering a hole, he approaches and realizes it's the hiding spot. Opening the lid, he finds the stairs and starts descending. A punk watches over the place. Lin Mu attacks him from behind as he screams for help. Lin Mu eliminates him, dons his clothes, and moves forward. Standing in front of a door, he informs someone, saying, Sir, something has happened. A bald punk emerges, inquiring about the situation. As Lin Mu is about to respond, the bald punk seizes his gun, demanding an explanation. Lin Mu holds his hand, attempting to resist, but the bald punk kicks. In response, Lin Mu kicks back, breaking the punk's leg. He falls to the ground, pointing his gun at Lin Mu, demanding to know his identity. Lin Mu swiftly moves, punches him, and knocks him out. Observing the surroundings, he remarks, it seems like all the hostages are here. He observes two large bags there and contemplates them. He goes, checks, finds money inside and thinks just as expected. He believes they have stolen a substantial amount of money with non-consecutive serial numbers and the hostages are unaware of his identity. Taking the bags, he moves and thinks of this money as his own. A black-haired lady observes him leaving and thinks it appears they are fighting among themselves. She notices the punk's gun and perceives an opportunity. Swiftly moving, she picks up the gun and points it toward Lin Mu, instructing him not to move. He expresses that he doesn't want to make things difficult for everyone, and they can all leave now. She responds affirmatively, stating they will leave, but as a police officer, she cannot let him go and instructs him to put the bags down. He acknowledges that she is with the police and agrees that he will take one bag, and they can have the other one. They can then act as if they have never met. She instructs him to stop talking, put the bags down, place his hands on his head, and get on the ground, warning that she will shoot otherwise. He complies, putting the bags down and agreeing to follow her instructions. She orders a hostage to go and tie his hands with a belt. As the hostage approaches, Lin Mu attacks him, pushing him onto the lady, and both fall to the ground. Lin Mu seizes the gun and suggests there was no need for that, advising her to go back and sit in the corner. They all proceed to sit in the corner as he departs with the bags. Once again, he swaps his clothes with the punk and remarks perfect. He steps outside and tosses the bags into a well, thinking he will retrieve them once everything is done. He calls Tang Bebe and informs her that he has discovered a suspicious location. They all arrive and rescue the hostages. He mentions that he has already informed headquarters about finding the hostages and they can proceed with the next steps. She acknowledges, saying everything is okay and all the hostages are safe. She adds that the rescue operation went smoothly, but they are not finished yet. She states one of the hostages mentioned a suspicious situation, prompting them to go down and investigate again. He inquires about what seems suspicious, and she explains that the hostage reported that the two bandits guarding them began fighting, but when they arrived at the scene, both were knocked out and the hostage also mentioned stolen money, yet neither of the bandits possessed it. She notes that the person who incapacitated the bandits left no trace and was undoubtedly a master, handling them with ease. Considering the possibility of a mercenary, she emphasizes the need to report this to her superiors. He agrees, acknowledging that she is right, and it must have been a master. After a while, at the Soaring Dragon Group, Tang Bebe bids farewell to Lin Mu. 
He mentions that since they have completed their business there, he will leave first as he has other matters to attend to. He says goodbye and heads out, hailing a taxi and instructs the driver to go to Pingyang District. Upon arrival, he hands over the money and instructs the driver to wait for him as he is going to pack some clothes and return shortly. After some time, he returns and instructs the driver to open the trunk. The driver complies and Lin Mu places the bags in the trunk before getting into the taxi. The driver observes his apparent happiness and inquires whether the bags only contain clothes. Lin Mu thinks to himself that of course those clothes are worth 10 million euros and asks if he does. The scene shifts to Wang Junli, who is seated in his office. A guard enters to deliver a report, stating they have received the results from the hospital, and hands him the report. He reveals that no signs of poisoning were found in his body. He remarks that he is in good health and everything appears fine. Wang Junli cautions the guard to be mindful of his words, reminding him that there are certain things he should not say, and dismisses him. Wang Junli then wonders if the kid was bluffing. Just then, his phone rings, and he receives a call from an unknown number. He answers the call and asks who it is. Lin Mu inquires if he has forgotten him so soon. He laughs and asks what the matter is. Lin Mu casually mentions that he has booked a room at Riverview Restaurant and invites him over to catch up. Wang Junli agrees and assures Lin Mu that he will be there soon. Suspicious, he asks Lin Mu what he is trying to pull. After a while, he arrives and Lin Mu comments on his speed. He downplays it, urging Lin Mu to get straight to the point. Lin Mu mentions it's nothing important, but Wang Junli insists that he is sure Lin Mu is aware of his family situation. Lin Mu acknowledges this and expresses his need for Wang Junli's assistance. Wang Junli tells him to state his orders. Lin Mu explains that he has some extra money on hand, but he hasn't found an excellent way to deal with it. Given the size of Wang Junli's business, he believes he can help. Wang Junli reassures him, saying it's a piece of cake and he may not have many other skills, but he is knowledgeable in business. He inquires about the amount of extra money Lin Mu is referring to. Lin Mu mentions it's about 120 million, and he doesn't care what Wang Junli does with it. He just wants his investment to grow. Wang Junli assures him that it's not a problem at all. Lin Mu expresses his gratitude in advance, and Wang Junli responds that he is most welcome and happy to help. After a while in the dormitory, Lin Mu sits at his laptop and contemplates the challenges of cultivating with so many students around. He decides it's better to move out. Looking out of the window, he finds the place appealing and announces that he's going out. Upon coming out, he identifies the place as suitable and hopes the landlord is reasonable. He presses the doorbell button. Meng Xuan opens the door and asks if she may inquire who he is looking for. Lin Mu mentions that he saw the rental ad on the internet and it's for this place. Meng Xuan, the lady, confirms and asks if he is here to rent. Lin Mu affirms and inquires about the monthly rent. She hands him slippers and suggests discussing the price after he has seen the room. They both enter the premises. Meng Xuan introduces herself and asks for his name. Lin Mu identifies himself as Lin Mu. Meng Xuan informs him that all the rooms upstairs are already rented, so he can only rent a room on the first floor. She takes him into a room and states that this is it, with a rent of 8,000 per month and a rental term of one year with no deposit required. Lin Mu expresses that if it's just a room on the first floor, 8,000 is a bit expensive. Meng Xu encounters, suggesting that if he finds it expensive, he should explore nearby private houses, as they are rented out at several hundred per month. <laughs> Song arrives and inquires if there is another new tenant, remarking that the rental money is negligible for him. She asserts her proficiency in managing money, stating that it shouldn't matter if the first floor is not rented out. She turns to Lin Mu and asks why he is there. Meng Xuan questions if they know each other, and Miss Song affirms, mentioning that Lin Mu is her student at Donghai University. Lin Mu thinks it might be a little inconvenient to have someone he knows living in the same house and decides to find another place. 
Politely, he apologizes, stating that the rent is still too high for him, and he moves to leave, asking for their understanding. Miss Song bids him goodbye, thinking about Lin Mu's family background and wondering why he cares about money. She contemplates whether something has happened to his family. The scene transitions to Lin Mu's new residence. As he looks around, he thinks that this is it, but he is still not accustomed to European-style decor. However, he appreciates the quietness, which is excellent for cultivation. He comments on the amazing kitchen, noting that it has been a long time since he cooked. After a while, he cooks food, sits down to eat, and remarks that his cooking skills remain the same. However, he expresses dissatisfaction with the quality of the ingredients and mentions that he will see if he can order better ingredients online. Simultaneously, he plans to search for suitable medicinal materials for concoctions. While exploring, he comes across a mujai herb and asks about it. He learns that it is not just any herb, but a 300-year-old mujai herb tailor made for him, and the medicinal materials are in South Valley City, and he decides that he will have to visit the place in person. The scene shifts to Lin Mu going to the airport, and he reflects that it is his first time on a plane, wondering how it feels. He decides to check his seat number, takes out his phone, and remarks that it's nice to have an organization supporting him. Meanwhile, on the plane, Luo Bingyun sits, notices Lin Mu coming inside, and asks who that is, questioning if they did not book the entire plane. The brown-haired boy explains that before they boarded the plane, the airline informed him that someone important had reserved a seat. She questions someone important and comments that he looks rather ordinary. Lin Mu proceeds to take his seat, and the brown-haired boy suggests to Luo Bingyun that he can inform the airline if she is upset about it. She responds that it's fine and adds that compared to those people she has met recently, he's quite interesting. After a while, the plane landed, and Lin Mu disembarked along with a member of the Hayu group. Luo Bingyun looks at Lin Mu strangely, and her guard asks if she wants them to do something. She responds that it's okay, she is just not used to it. Later, in a conference room, a man stands at the dais and announces that up next is a precious herb obtained from a herbalist, confirmed for its high medicinal value by an appraiser. He declares that the auction price starts from 100,000 yuan. Lin Mu expresses his bid for only 100,000 yuan, stating that these people have no idea how much the Muji herb is worth. The bidding commences, and Lin Mu raises it to 300,000. The man with glasses announces 300,000 going once and inquires if there is a higher bid, ultimately declaring it sold at 300,000. He adds that the herb now belongs to Lin Mu. Lin Mu takes the herb, walks out, and contemplates that when he returns to Donghai City, the copper cauldron he ordered should have arrived too. After a while, at the dinner banquet, Liu Bingyan calls Zioli and instructs her to come over. She hands her a wine glass and asks her to hold it. Zioli questions where she is going, pointing out that the banquet is not over yet. Liu Bingyan replies that she is heading out to get some fresh air and leaves the rest to Zioli. She comes out and sits in the car, expressing relief at finally leaving that place. She states, however, that her bodyguards are still following her, and while it may be for her own good, deploying four special forces soldiers is going over the top. She decides to take the opportunity to drive at top speed and presses the accelerator. The guard instructs the others to follow her quickly. They quickly start following her. She suggests they catch up and take a sharp turn. The guard stops the car, and the other guard asks why they are not following her. He inquires if he can't see the red light. She expresses relief that she can finally be free for a while. Considering her next steps, she decides that she should at least call them so they won't worry. Suddenly, a man runs in front of her car and she stops. A bullet hits her car. She comes out of the car and questions if that person fired at her. She expresses gratitude that she slammed on the brakes to avoid him, otherwise she might have died. She runs from there toward a street, realizing that someone spotted the car. She decides that she better find a place to hide and wait for the bodyguards to rescue her. She thinks that if she hides here, she should be safe for now. Hearing footsteps, she considers that the sound is rather light, probably just a passerby. 
Lin Mu passes by. She sees him and recognizes him as the person who was on the plane. She grabs his hand and asks him to wait. He inquires about the matter, apologizing and stating that he doesn't need any services, insisting she has got the wrong person. She becomes angry, thinking about who he thinks she is. She calls after him and tells him to stop. He asks what it is now. She clarifies that he misunderstood the situation, revealing that someone wants to kill her, and she asks if he can help her. He suggests that if that's the case, she should follow him and mentions that he will take her to the police station, where the police can protect her. After a while, they arrive at the police station. He informs her that they are there and advises her to go in. He starts to leave, suggesting that once she has reported the matter, she should ask the police to take her back and stop wandering around alone. She begins to follow him. He questions what's wrong and if there is anything else. She inquires if he really does not recognize her. He insists that he does not know her and doesn't think they have met before. He adds that he has something to attend to and bids her goodbye. She thinks about how this person may not recognize her and not only that, but he also seems eager to leave. She contemplates that she can't inform the police about the attack, as someone in the family will handle it, and the top priority now is to find a safe place for her to hide. She concludes that since he can't remember meeting on the plane, he can't wait to get rid of a burden like her. She mentions that she is hungry but doesn't have any money on her. She asks if he can treat her to dinner and assures him that she will pay him back later. He responds that after she is done eating, she should go home immediately or call the police, emphasizing that she should not wander around alone. Later, they both walk at Lin Mu's residential area and she inquires about restaurants in the neighborhood. He responds that of course there are none and asks if she is not hungry. He suggests taking her home and making dinner for her. She thinks that although she doesn't think he's malicious, this is too reckless. They both enter the house. She remarks that the design is very tasteful. He suggests she have a seat, to which she agrees. Observing her foot, he thinks that her ankle looks quite severely injured and he finds it amazing that she did not complain on their way there. He informs her that he will be back in just a moment. Upon his return with a tub of water, he suggests that since her ankle is injured, it's best to soak it in hot water. Once the bruises subside, he will give her a massage. She expresses gratitude and puts her foot in the water. She realizes that she has not introduced herself yet and mentions that her name is Luo Bingyun. She asks about him, and he responds that he is Lin Mu. He advises her to continue soaking her feet while he prepares dinner. She thinks that he seems to treat her like an ordinary person, and it feels good to have someone who cares about her and takes care of her without any ulterior motive. He returns with food and comments that she seems excited, asking if she is that hungry. She denies it, and he suggests she put on her slippers so they can eat. She mentions that he also thoughtfully prepared slippers for her. He mentions that it's just a simple meal, and he hopes she won't mind. She responds by saying he is too humble and everything is delicious. He encourages her to eat more if she enjoys the food. Seizing the opportunity, she asks if he really doesn't remember her. He affirms that he genuinely does not and inquires if they have met somewhere before. She provides hints, mentioning Nangu City and the first class. He suddenly recalls and says that it was her. She expresses disbelief that it took him so long and notes that she still looks exactly the same. Curious about the threats to her life, he asks why people are after her. She suggests it's probably a business competitor resorting to such a nefarious method to achieve their goals and she is used to it. He decides not to probe any further and offers to help her with her ankle injury once she's done with dinner. She agrees, thanking him. As he starts to check her ankle, he informs her that he will help ease the bruises, warning that it may be a little painful, so she should endure it. He mentions that luckily, it's just a sprain and there are no other significant problems. However, it's still an ankle injury and if it's not taken care of, it may affect her movement. He informs her that he will try something else, but it may hurt a lot more. After the procedure, he declares that it's done. 
She expresses amazement, stating that she doesn't feel any pain now, and she asks if he is a doctor trained in chiropractic. He responds that, of course not, he is still in university. She finds it impressive and asks if she can take a shower using his bathroom. He agrees, asking her to give him a moment. He moves and informs her that he will get her a change of clothes. He explains that he lives alone, so he doesn't have any dresses for women, but she can wear them for now. She agrees, expressing gratitude. He mentions that he placed the slippers right outside the bathroom door and advises her to be careful of the wet floor. She acknowledges by saying, got it. He sits on the sofa and notices the mujai herb placed on the table. He mentions that he has to think about how he wants to use it. Just then, she knocks and enters the room, stating that she is done and feels much better. He comments that she looks good in that. She points to the herbs and asks what they are. He explains that they are some medicinal herbs and he is going to use them to make medicine. She suggests that he is young and healthy and doesn't need to eat such things. He responds that he has always been sick, so he needs long-term medication to improve his health. She proposes that she knows some capable Western doctors and asks if she should introduce them to him for examination. He thanks her but declines, stating that it's okay and he has to slowly recuperate through traditional Chinese medicine, as Western medicine won't work. He mentions that it's getting late and it's not safe for a girl to go home alone. He suggests that she get some rest in the guest room for tonight and they can decide what to do tomorrow. She agrees, saying that she will stay the night and rest early, wishing him good night. The scene shifts to the following day when Lin Mu comes back home and sees her slipper outside the door. He notes that she left. He detects the smell of food and goes inside, finding delicious dishes on the table. He remarks, what a spread. Observing a note under a plate, he picks it up and reads it. In the letter, she mentions that she will be leaving first as she needs to deal with numerous things at the company. She prepared a few dishes, unsure if they suited his taste, and asks him to remember to call her when he has time. She thanks him for looking after her. Lin Mu starts eating and comments, well don't mind if he does. Taking a bite, he exclaims, delicious. He expresses surprise that she's a better cook than he expected. After a while, he says now that he is done with the meal, he will try preparing some medicinal cuisine using the herb. He starts boiling the herb and mentions that the next step is to boil it slowly, hoping that this will work on the first try. Meanwhile, in Manhattan, Mr. B Luo angrily mentions that his daughter was attacked and almost died. He questions if they are even protecting her appropriately. The guard apologizes, stating that it's all their fault. Handing him a file, he informs Mr. Du Luo that they have already found the attacker and have information about the instigator, asking him to take a look. Mr. Luo expresses more significant concern about the man Bing Yun is staying with. The guard assures him that they have also collected information about that guy. Mr. Luo examines the file and discovers that it's about Lin Mu from the Lin family in Donghai City, who came back from the dead. The guard explains that, according to the hospital, Lin Mu likely overexerted himself physically, resulting in a state of temporary suspended animation. In response, Mr. Mu's Liu asks if, after waking up, Lin Mu's height and appearance changed, and his temperament changed drastically as well. The guard affirms this, mentioning that the hospital described it as a miracle, and regarding his temperament, it's likely due to his amnesia, Mr. Luo then inquires about Lin Mu's relationship with Bing Yun. He explains that five days ago, they took the same plane to Nanhai City together, and then they chanced upon each other when MS Luo was attacked. They can be considered friends for the time being. Mr. Luo acknowledges this, stating that he doesn't want to hear any more news about Bing Yun being in danger from now on. They note his instructions and leave the room. Mr. Luo thinks about Lin Mu. Meanwhile, Lin Mu is still boiling the herbs and exclaims it worked. He puts it in a bowl, starts making pills, and mentions that without spiritual power, he has to do it manually, and this means he is unable to make too many of them at one go. He then declares he is done and makes many pills. He takes one pill and says he will test out their effectiveness first. 
He eats it and notes that the medicinal effect is a little weak, but he can have a few more. Even with the sparse spiritual kai and lack of resources, nothing can stop him from climbing back to the peak. The scene shifts to Lin Mu, who is seated in the class with Tang Beibei, using his phone. She inquires about what he is doing, and he responds that he is checking his test results. Impressed, she remarks that his grades have improved by leaps and bounds since being discharged from the hospital and suggests that maybe she should try falling off a building too. He advises against it. Du Xiaoyu's friend mentions that everyone is saying Lin Mu will experience great things since he survived something so traumatic. Du Xiaoyu responds, saying to let others say whatever they want and advises not to participate in gossip. She asserts that regardless of what others say, he is still her fiancé, even though he spends a lot of time with Tang Bebe. Du Xiaoyu clarifies that he is only her fiancé in name, and she doesn't care who he hangs out with. Meanwhile, Luo Bingyun arrives and proceeds to Lin Mu's class. A messenger informs Lin Mu that someone is looking for him. Upon seeing her, he recognizes her and remarks that he did not expect her arrival. Curious, he inquires about the reason for her visit. She explains that since someone never called her, she had to come and find him in person. He apologizes, acknowledging that he has been quite busy lately and expressing regret for completely forgetting about their arrangement. She observes that he doesn't appear busy and mentions seeing him happily chatting with his classmate when she enters. He clarifies that the class had just ended and he was engaging in friendly conversation to strengthen their friendship. Unconcerned, she insists that she doesn't care and instructs him to accompany her for a meal. He explains that today is his grandfather's 80th birthday and he needs to celebrate it with him. She inquires about the birthday celebration, expressing her desire to attend. He questions whether it would be appropriate and mentions that his relatives are peculiar, expressing concern about her being scared by them. Undeterred, she reassures him that she can handle it. He agrees, stating that he has another class to attend and suggests going together after that. She departs, affirming that he should inform her once he's finished, and she will pick him up. He hopes his classmates did not notice what just happened. His classmates begin to gossip. One remarks that Lin Mu has such a beautiful girlfriend and he never mentioned her before. Another adds that he seems to be hiding the gorgeous lady from everyone. A third classmate comments that it's no wonder he's not staying on campus anymore and having a girlfriend will make staying here inconvenient for him. He then asks if she can introduce him to some of her friends. Lin Mu hastily departs, expressing the need to leave now. He emerges and expresses relief, stating that, luckily, he got out in time. Otherwise, he wouldn't even know how to explain himself. Tang Bebe follows him and accuses him of escaping without informing her, questioning if he is hiding something and demanding an explanation. He asserts that he is not hiding anything from her and emphasizes that they have only met twice. He recounts their first meeting on a plane where they didn't even speak and the second time in a small alley near his house, where she claimed to be chased and in need of help. He took her to the police station and they shared a meal together. She points out that they have only met twice, yet she's already searching for him on campus, insinuating whether he expects her to devote her life to him just because he helped her once. He questions why a girl like her would do something like that. She counters, asking why she is so clingy toward her and mentioning her flirtatious behavior, noting how she even wanted to follow him home for dinner. He asks why she is so concerned about her, to which she denies being concerned and claims she is only afraid that he might be tricked, because, after all, pretty women are dangerous. He asserts that he is not a child and not easily tricked, urging her to focus on their class, but she insists on him not changing the topic and demands that he tell her everything now. Du Xiaoyu's friend approaches her and asks if she notices that. She responds affirmatively, stating that a girl came looking for Lin Mu and even expressed a desire to celebrate old master Lin's birthday with him. She remarks on Lin Mu bringing another woman home and questions how Du Xiaoyu can remain so calm. Unfazed, Du Xiaoyu responds that it has nothing to do with her and points out that both of them want to break off the engagement. 
She argues that it hasn't happened yet and that Lin Mu is just doing this to humiliate her. Another friend agrees, saying that's right. Du Zaiyu interrupts, stating that's enough and instructs them to sit down as the lecturer will arrive soon. After class, Lin Mu exits and Luo Bingyun spots him. She inquires if he can drive and he affirms that he can. She suggests he should drive since he knows the way back. He takes the driver's seat and begins to drive while she sits beside him, feeling some pain in her ankle. Concerned, he asks what's wrong and if she is still injured. She reassures him that it's fine now but mentions that her foot will still get sore if she wears high heels for hours. He questions why she doesn't stop wearing them, to which she replies that heels make her look prettier and taller. He adds that he doesn't really understand girls and that she will endure the pain for the sake of beauty. She explains that usually it doesn't matter, but today is a special day. After a while, they arrive at the Lin family mansion. Uncle Chen sees Lin Mu and exclaims that he is back, greeting him. He then notices Luo Bingyun and inquires about her. Lin Mu introduces her as his friend Luo Bingyun, mentioning that he brought her to celebrate Grandpa's birthday. She greets Uncle Chen, saying it's nice to meet him. He responds, saying, welcome, please come in. As he moves to enter, he gazes at the rooftop and stops. She asks what the matter is, and he replies nothing, let's go in. Once inside the house, she observes the grandeur of the guest and comments on how huge his house is. Uncle Lin Yitai remarks that the girl beside Lin Mu looks familiar. Uncle Lin Yifu agrees but confesses that he doesn't remember who she is. A green-haired man questions if she is not the daughter of the Luo family. Uncle Lin Yifu ponders about the Haiyu group and wonders how Lin Mu got to know someone from the Luo family. Du Zaiyu then asks if she is Luo Bingyan. Uncle Lin Yidai wonders if the Luo family is here to support Lin Mu. Uncle Yifu ponders whether the plan that has been in motion for years will be ruined by the whims of the Luo family. Aunt Lin Rong questions what took him so long. Lin Mu explains that he had classes in the afternoon, so he could only come home after school. She then asks Luo Bingyun if she is not President Luo, expressing surprise at her attendance at their old man's 80th birthday celebration and deeming it an honor. Luo Bingyun modestly responds that she is flattering her and clarifies that she is present as a friend of Lin Mu, not on behalf of the Haiyu group. Aunt Lin Rong warmly welcomes her on behalf of the whole family. Lin Mu then inquires about his grandpa's whereabouts. Aunt Lin Rong explains that soon after his parents died, the older man contracted Alzheimer's disease and can't handle this kind of event anymore, so he stays in the study upstairs. Lin Mu acknowledges this and decides to head upstairs to visit him. Luo Bingyan expresses her intention to go with him. Uncle Yifu asks if he has noticed anything. Aunt Lin Rong asserts that this girl is not simple, and there's no opening she can notice. He inquires about her relationship with Lin Mu. She replies that it's hard to say, but they are not lovers. He remarks that she never knows, and things will only get trickier from now on. Lin Mu goes to his grandpa and greets him, saying he is home. A servant attempts to feed the grandpa, but he stops her. Lin Mu requests that she leave them first, as he wants to talk to his grandpa. She agrees and leaves. Lin Mu wishes his grandpa a happy birthday, asking him to take a closer look and see if he recognizes him. The grandpa responds with Mu. Luo Bingyun steps forward and expresses her wishes for his boundless happiness and a long, long life. Lin Mu clarifies that she's his friend and is here to celebrate his birthday. The grandpa responds with an okay. A servant interrupts, saying that dinner is about to start and Miss Du Zaiyu is downstairs. Lin Mu acknowledges and instructs the servant to take care of the old man while he heads downstairs. He descends the stairs and Du Zaiyu informs him that she has been waiting for him for a long time. He asks her why she is there and she explains that her grandpa asked her to come as a representative of her family. She points to a vase and mentions that it's a birthday gift from the Du family. He identifies it as a Daokai porcelain vase from the Yangzheng period. Someone comments that it's indeed from the Yangzheng period and another person remarks on what a rare treasure it is. 
The conversation continues, with someone stating that Old Master Du is really generous, and he estimates the vase to be worth at least tens of millions. Lin Mu expresses gratitude for the sincerity, but insists that the birthday gift is too precious and asks her to take it back. Du Zaiyu, however, asserts that regardless, she is technically Old Master Lin's daughter-in-law, and she should give him a birthday gift. Lin Mu questions if she has experienced death like him, and wonders why she suddenly remembers that she is engaged to him, and how she suddenly recalls the marriage contract with the Lin family. She explains that the engagement was decided by the old masters of the two families, and until it's terminated, she is still the daughter-in-law of the Lin family. She believes it's her duty to come and celebrate the old master's birthday considering it a responsibility that she, as a junior, should fulfill. He disagrees, stating that she must be mistaken. He adds that if he had gone to the Du family earlier to terminate the engagement, she would not have had to come here in person today. Someone inquires about breaking off the engagement, and another person wonders who the one wanting it off might be. The third person speculates that it's probably not old man Lin's wish, given that he doesn't have Alzheimer's. Aunt Lin Rong interrupts, asking what they are discussing and why they want to break off the engagement. Lin Mu explains that Miss Du thinks he is not a good match for her, so she has asked him several times to break off the engagement. However, her grandpa does not want to be the one to bring it up. Lin Mu declares that it's not a problem, he will do it and ask to break off the engagement. Du Zaiyu nonchalantly responds with whatever he wants. Luo Bingyan chimes in, mentioning that she also prepared a gift for his grandpa and hopes he will like it. Lin Mu protests, saying she shouldn't have. However, she hands him a box and urges him to open it. As he does, he finds a ring inside. She reveals it to be Emperor Kangxi's jade ring, made of top-tier jadeite and named Kuiyang. Du Zaiyu comments that the jadeite is not bad but questions if it's the real one or not. Luo Bingyan remarks that Miss Du has a good eye, being able to recognize top-grade jadeite. Since it's made from top-grade jadeite, she believes it must be real, and she doubts that anyone would dare to cheat the Luo family. Du Zaiyu concedes, saying that if Miss Luo said that, then she thinks it's real, congratulating Grandpa Lin for receiving such a rare gift. Lin Mu expresses his gratitude. He announces that he has accepted the gift from the Du family on behalf of his grandpa and adds that he will pay a visit next time to formally break off the engagement. This way, Miss Du won't have to waste her time and effort again. Aunt Rong questions how he can decide this himself, stating that the engagement was arranged by his grandpa. Lin Mu responds that melons taken unwillingly won't taste sweet, and since neither of them wants the engagement, it's better to end it amicably. Aunt Rong agrees, saying, all right. After the party, Lin Mu leaves with Luo Bingyan in the car. He observes that Du Zaiyu looks kinda pretty and questions if he won't regret breaking off the engagement with her. He responds that she doesn't want to bother with him, so it doesn't matter how smart and pretty she is. Luo Bingyan suggests he try pursuing her to check her feelings, proposing that it might change her mind. Lin Mu dismisses the idea, stating that he doesn't have to marry her, considering there are many other pretty, smart, and rich girls out there. He adds that it's not his style to reach for something that's not his. She remarks on his slick tongue and then stops the car, announcing that they have arrived. As he exits the car, he gives her his phone number, reminding her to drive carefully and to call him if she ever needs him. She agrees, and he says goodbye. Later, he discovers a note on his shirt, realizing it's from his grandpa. The note assures him not to worry about his grandpa, explaining that he simply doesn't want to bother with them. He is aware of the family's ongoing fight for the inheritance, which is why he's pretending to have Alzheimer's. The note assures Lin Mu that everything is taken care of, as he has written a will and left him some money, so he doesn't have to worry about the family's affairs. The note encourages him to live on. The scene shifts to the Du family's resort the next day. Lin Mu arrives, and a guard asks who he is and what he is doing there. He responds that he is Lin Mu from the Lin family and wishes to have an audience with Grandpa Du. The guard verifies that he is alone and then directs him, stating that the old master will see him. 
Lin Mu expresses his gratitude and proceeds forward. Upon meeting Grandpa Du, Lin Mu greets him. He inquires if he needs him for something. He decides to cut to the chase and asks if he is close with his granddaughter Du Zaiyu. Grandpa Du questions if there is anything wrong with that girl. Lin Mu reassures him, saying it's nothing significant, but she's just a little unhappy with the engagement he arranged with his grandpa. Grandpa Du dismisses it, stating that it's natural for kids to have disagreements and that he doesn't have to take her seriously. Lin Mu, expressing their shared straightforwardness, suggests that since Du Zaiyu doesn't want this, he won't take more of her time, proposing to break off the engagement. A brown-haired man interjects, questioning if Lin Mu thinks he can break it off so easily and who he thinks he is. Grandpa Du instructs him to shut up and then turns to Lin Mu, asking if he is there to break off the engagement. He agrees, stating that Du Zaiyu and he will be like strangers after that. Grandpa Du concedes, allowing the engagement to be called off, but advises Lin Mu not to assert that the Du family is in the wrong. Lin Mu assures him that he will take all the blame. He adds that if that is all, he won't take more of his time and starts to leave, saying goodbye. The brown-haired man questions why Lin Mu let it go so easily and expresses concern about how the public will view the Du family if the news spreads. Lin Mu responds that the reason the Du family is in this situation is because of him. He tells the man not to worry about those guys and insists he knows all about his business with the Luo family. Lin Mu praises the Luo family, stating they are a great family, even stronger than the Lin family. He suggests that if Zaiyu can marry into the Luo family, it would greatly benefit them. Grandpa Du asks if Lin Mu thinks he doesn't understand and informs him that he doesn't have to hide all that stuff now that the engagement is off. Meanwhile, Miss Song Yuru is out buying something in the city center. Lin Mu notices her and remarks on the coincidence, offering to help her with her items. She thanked him and handed over the stuff. Lin Mu inquires about whose birthday it is, and she reveals that it's her own. She bought a cake to celebrate. Lin Mu asks if she's celebrating all alone, to which she responds that she has one of her roommates joining and invites him to join as well. Just then, Lai Guang Rui arrives and questions how she can be so casual about her birthday, insisting that he will treat her to a feast. She declines, stating that she already has someone at home to celebrate with. Lai Guang Rui suggests bringing her along too, emphasizing the importance of birthdays in Korea. She apologizes, stating that she is Chinese and the Korean trick won't work on him. As she turns to leave, a guard blocks her way, and she questions Lai Guang Rui about the meaning of this. Lai Guang Rui expresses that he has pursued her for a long time and asks if she can't just give him a chance. He questions why she chose Lin Mu over him. Lin Mu interjects, asking what this has to do with him. Ms. Song Yuru states that compared to Lin Mu, he is absolute garbage and disgusts her. She instructs him to get out of her face. Lai Guang Rui retorts that the only reason he can tolerate this is because he likes her and questions if Lin Mu really thinks she is great. He brings up what happened to her and asserts that if it weren't for him, she wouldn't even be here right now. He tells Lin Mu to stop dreaming, predicting that she will discard him when she's done. Miss Song Yuru tells Lai Guang Rui to shut up and stop slandering her. Lai Guang Rui insists that sooner or later, she will be done with Lin Mu anyway. She warns him to leave now, or she won't let this go easily. Lai Guang Rui questions if she thinks she can beat him and remarks on her silky legs, expressing a desire to touch them again. Miss Song Yuru attempts to kick him and tells him to go to hell. Lai Guang Rui challenges her to come at him again, stating he will give her some pointers. Lin Mu remarks that it sure is hard to be a nice guy, considering he was helping her carry stuff. A guard moves to attack him, urging him to stop wasting time. Lin Mu retaliates, punching back and knocking them out. Miss Song Yuru asks if he is alright. Lin Mu assures her that he's fine, explaining that those two ganged up on him and he wanted to run, but when he opened his eyes again, they were on the ground, possibly saved by a master. She inquires about the savior, wondering why she doesn't see them. 
Lin Mu explains that experts are never to be seen. Song Yuru expresses relief as long as he is okay. An injured guard interjects, insisting that it was clearly him. Lin Mu steps on his hand to make him quiet. Miss Song Yuru suggests leaving, stating that her mood was ruined by these guys. Lai Guang Rui questions her decision to leave after he hurt his men. She responds that it wasn't their fault they got hurt, advising him to find that expert if he wants revenge. She questions what good it would do if he came after them. He declares that all they do is hide, and he wants to see if there are any experts to save him now. Song Yuru advises Lin Mu not to go, mentioning that he has won many taekwondo competitions and is very strong. Lai Guang Rui dismisses him as trash and tells him to stop hiding behind a woman. Lin Mu responds that if he walks away now, he will lose all his honor, so if Lai Guang Rui wants to fight, he'll play with him for a little. Lin Mu challenges Lai Guang Rui, suggesting they see what he's got. Lai Guang Rui taunts him, stating that it's nice to see he has some courage. They both move to attack each other, and Lai Guang Rui warns Lin Mu not to beg him to stop afterwards. She advises him to be careful. Lin Mu observes that Lai Guang Rui doesn't seem like a scrub, but he'd be dreaming if he thinks he can beat him. Lai Guang Rui moves to kick him, saying, take this, but Lin Mu stops his attack. Lai Guang Rui acknowledges that it's not bad, he can actually block his roundhouse kick. Lin Mu challenges him, saying, let's see what he is going to do now. Ms. Song Yuru asks if he is all right. Lai Guang Rui wonders how this kid is okay after taking a hit from him, considering he can easily break a plank the size of a bowl. Lin Mu responds that of course he is fine, but he does not expect him to be this good. Ms. Song Yuru compliments Lin Mu, stating that he is not bad either, and asks when he got so good. Lin Mu explains that he realized he was too weak after being discharged from the hospital. Lai Guang Rui moves to attack him again, challenging him to take it if he can. Lin Mu dismisses Lai Guang Rui, saying whatever he wants, and moves his hand forward. He notices his hand and contemplates if he wants to catch his foot from his flying kick. Lin Mu asserts that he can't let him catch his foot and can't let him have the chance, so he switches legs to attack. Miss Song Yuru witnesses all this and is shocked. Lin Mu holds his leg and declares that since he wants to harm him, he will teach him a lesson and break his foot. Lin Mu advises him not to attempt moves that are too hard if he's not good enough, or else he will just make a fool of himself. Lin Mu and Miss Song Yuru move to leave from there. She expresses her surprise, stating that it's only been a few months and he is already so skilled. Lin Mu replies that he did it to get a little healthier, not expecting it to come in handy. She comments that he looks like an entirely different person, having improved in all aspects. Changing the subject, she mentions that his roommate is also pretty good at martial arts. Lin Mu inquires if that's Xi Roman 11, the person Lai Guang Rui mentioned. She confirms that Xi Roman 11 started her training at a very young age, and her sword flows like water. Lin Mu asks about what an expert like her normally does. She explains that she doesn't know. Xi Roman 11 leaves the house early and comes back late, never mentioning it. As they reach her house, she invites him in for some tea and mentions that the expert is home today. Lin Mu declines, saying he is all right and still has something to do, but wishes her a happy birthday. He moves to leave and says, see him. She responds with all right, see him, and visit next time. As he walks on the road, he hears someone shout to stop him, claiming he is a thief. He instructs them to move and get out of the way. Lin Mu thinks it might be better to save some trouble and not get involved. Just then, a police car arrives and Officer Wang steps out, ordering the thief to stop right there. The thief attempts to jump and cross the road, but he slips and falls. The officer follows, advising him not to fight back as it's futile. The thief takes out a knife and directs offensive language towards the officer. She tells him to stop resisting, stating that he is under arrest and that attacking an officer is a serious crime. He argues that it's only a crime when she arrests him, and as long as he is free, he can do anything. 
she counters, mentioning reinforcements on the way. She proposes that if he turns himself in, she can pretend this didn't happen and theft is not a serious crime, offering him a chance. He rejects the offer, stating he will never turn himself in. She declares that he leaves her with no choice and moves toward him. He points the knife and warns her to stop, not to come any closer. She grabs his hand, twists it, and brings him down to the road, stating that he just had to make things difficult. Suddenly, someone kicks her from behind, asserting that this is not something she should be involved in. She manages to get back up. The gray-haired thief retrieves the bag, and she comments that the three of them certainly have some guts. He suggests that there are things she should pretend she never saw and not go looking for trouble on the weekends. She responds, stating that she is a police officer, and she can't let criminals go. He retorts that she asked for it and moves to attack her. She maneuvers back and strikes with a barrier. He attempts to hit her with a knife, menacingly saying die. Lin Mu intervenes, grabbing his arm and urging forgiveness for mistakes. Lin Mu questions if it's necessary to kill for theft. The gray-haired thief decides to let her off for the day, but warns Lin Mu to tell the girl not to butt into everyone's business. Lin Mu agrees, and the thieves depart. However, Officer Wang proceeds to arrest Lin Mu. He inquires about the purpose of this. She asserts that he ought to be aware of his actions. He contends, requesting a moment as he was assisting her. She questions whether he can deny any connection to those criminals. He asserts that he only recently encountered them. She inquires why they heeded him. He explains it's because they are unable to overpower him in a confrontation, so they depart. She questions his ability to prevail against those three individuals and suggests initiating a report at the station for clarity. He requests the officer to wait, stating he still has unfinished business and inquires if she can permit him to leave. She firmly declines. Just then, an officer arrives and observes them, inquiring if the person present is not Officer Wang. He asks if she was the one who called for backup and remarks that it appears she apprehended the thief. She denies this, stating he is not the thief but may be an accomplice, requesting that he be taken back to the station. The officer places Lin Mu in the car and questions Officer Wang if she is returning. She explains that she twisted her ankle earlier and asks if he could lend her a hand please. He agrees and approaches her, extending his hand. He comments that she is really clumsy and she admits she went a little too hard. Upon noticing the handcuffs that she had used on Lin Mu's hands, she exclaims in surprise, questioning how it's possible that he managed to break out of the handcuffs. He wonders aloud if that guy is even human. Lin Mu manages to escape and thinks that he knows he should not have gotten involved. Just then, Ms. Song Yuru calls him. He asks if she did not just go home. She says yeah, but she forgot about some seasoning, so she came out to get some. Since he is just walking around, let's go eat at her place. Xi Roman 11 is also home, she can introduce those guys. He says sure and thinks he can go hide there for a bit. After a while, they reach home. Xi Roman 11 says that was quick and looks at Lin Mu, saying nice seasoning she got there, what a handsome guy. The girl in the white dress says don't scare him off. Lin Mu says hello, it's nice to meet them. She tells Song Yuru to quickly introduce them. Song Yuru says this is her student Lin Mu. Xi Roman 11 remarks that he looks like a very special student of hers and the first she has brought home. Song Yuru moves from there and explains that Lin Mu helped her teach Lai Guang Rui a lesson earlier, so she brought him back to thank him. Originally, he was almost their roommate, but Meng Xuan scared him off with the pricing. The girl in the white dress asks if Lai Guang Rui caused trouble again and why she was not told about this. Xi Roman 11 responds that she is not even home anyway, so of course, she would not know about it. She suggests that, since his name is Lin Mu, she can call him Ah Mu and says Lai Guang Rui is not a nice person, but since he can teach him a lesson, that means he has some skills. Lin Mu sits with them and says it's nothing compared to her really. She mentions that Yu Ru probably told him all about her and asks how else he would know that she trains in martial arts. She suggests that Meng Xuan is out of the country right now, 
so he should just move in. He responds that he probably won't do it as he has already found a place. She insists it's fine, he can have the room downstairs and they will take the upstairs. Additionally, he can help them lift stuff if they ever need assistance. Song Yuru arrives and supports the idea, saying that he should move in with them so they can help each other. He agrees, and the girl in the white dress adds that since they will be living under the same roof soon, let's set some ground rules first. She declares the rules. First, the upstairs is restricted to girls only, and he cannot come up without permission. Second, he will have to clean up after himself. And third, they can eat together, but he will have to do the dishes. Lin Mu asks how many rules there are. Xyroman11 says there are quite a few, so listen carefully. She states those are all the rules, and now let's party. She suggests they need to celebrate Yuru's birthday, and Yuru's mood changes in an instant. Two days later, the scene shifts to Lin Mu opening his car's back box. He remarks that he will never go shopping with girls again, considering the numerous clothes she buys. He declares, alright, that should be it. Office Wang expresses surprise, noting it's a coincidence to bump into her again. Lin Mu asks what's that? She questions his whereabouts, berates him, and asserts that he dared to trick her while riding a bicycle. Following him in her police car, she commands him to stop if he has any courage. Miss Song Yuru inquires about Lin Mu's location. A girl with a cap walking on the road, eating ice cream, remarks that the glasses boy should be informed. She is shocked as a police car swiftly passes, causing her ice cream to fall. She asks what that is and notices the fallen ice cream. Office Wang predicts that Lin Mu will have to pay once she catches him. The glasses boy questions a cop car chasing a speeding bike. Lin Mu comments on her relentlessness, stating that the tires will burn if it continues. He believes he has to find a way to lose her and enters a street. Meanwhile, Officer Wang thinks he can hide here. He dismounts from his bicycle and walks, saying he finally got rid of that crazy cop, while she suddenly appears and handcuffs him. She asks who he says is crazy, and he replies she's really annoying, chasing him all day, and asks what she wants. She replies nothing much, she says she just wants to take him back to the station because he ran away last time. He insists he hasn't done anything wrong, questioning why she always gives him trouble and points out a robber nearby. She asks if he thinks she would fall for it again. He claims there really is a robber and points to the crowd watching. She warns him that he's in trouble if he tricks her again and instructs him to stay there and wait for her. He questions if she really thought he would wait for her and walks away. She urges him to calm down and asks him to release the hostage. As he walks away, he asks why a robber is holding a hostage, finding it new and mentioning he hasn't seen this before. He suggests they go check it out. The cop is being held by the robber, who instructs the crowd to move aside, warning that the cop will die if they don't comply. Lin Mu inquires whether a cop has been taken hostage, and someone responds that no, it's a little girl who was taken, but the officer exchanged places with her, so she became the hostage instead. Lin Mu remarks that so, and she believes she has a good heart. Officer Wang addresses Lan Zidong, urging him to stop resisting as he is surrounded, and advises him to give up. Lan Zidong defiantly replies that it's only in her dreams, he will be fine with her by his side. He demands that they go away and prepare a car for him, threatening that otherwise, the cop will die. Lin Mu comments on how troublesome he is as he falls down, and Lan Zidong questions what he's doing. Lin Mu gets up and fixes his hair. She recognizes him, expressing concern about his presence in such a dangerous situation and urging him to stay back. Lin Mu mentions that this little one has always been a fan of Brother Lan Zidong and presents a small gift. A girl from the crowd asserts that the person in white stole her bag. Lin Mu informs Brother Lan Zidong that he's his idol and that he has always wanted to be like him since he was young. He adds that the girl chased him for hours, but in the end, he easily took care of her. The girl retorts that she knew he wasn't up to any good and that he's a criminal like Lan Ziding, the scum of society. Lin Mu commands her to shut up, stating that he didn't ask her to talk. 
He points out that he is talking to brother Lan Ziding and asks if she can't see that. Lan Ziding interjects, telling him to cut the nonsense and instructs him to get a car. They'll talk once they get out of there. Lin Mu assures him that she's on it, mentioning that the girl's car is parked close by. He tells brother Lan Ziding to wait for him and warns him to watch out as there's a sniper over there. Lan Ziding asks what he said, accusing him of lying and expressing a desire for him to die. Meanwhile, Lin Mu tosses a bag towards Lan Zidong and discards his pistol, but Lan Zidong fires at him. Lin Mu quickly retaliates, launching an attack and disarming him while delivering punches. Lin Mu captures him and forces him down to the floor. Lan Zidong declares his intention to kill him. Officer Wang intervenes, stating that she's done for now. Lin Mu requests Officer Wang to return the handbag to the lady on his behalf since his hands are full. Officer Wang complies, gathering all the items from the floor and acknowledging the request. Two officers arrive, taking Lan Zidong away as he warns that once he's out, he'll be holding a hostage with a gun, emphasizing that he won't be getting out this time. The scene shifts one hour later when Miss Song Yuru asks Lin Mu where he went and what happened. He takes a deep breath and says he doesn't want to talk about it. He had some bad luck and goes inside the house. She asks again about what happened, mentioning their worries, and he replies that it was nothing much, just a little accident. Inside, he inquires about what's on TV, and a girl with long hair expresses her desire to go somewhere, but the tickets are hard to get. Miss Song Yuru informs them that Yao Zion Zion is having a concert soon. Zaizu comments that Lin Mu ditched them, and he's not even going to apologize. Lin Mu asserts that of course he will make it up to them, and says to wait a second as he needs to make a call. Zaizu remarks that he just got back, anticipating more trouble. He responds with a yeah mentioning that he'll tell her in a bit. She asks again if he's really just a student because he seems all mysterious and stuff. Song Yuru agrees, saying that sometimes he looks and acts really mature for his age. Zaizu questions if it's just mature, and Lin Mu informs them about Yao Zion Zion's concert, saying they have time to go in three days. Zaizu expresses her long-time desire to attend the concert and asks how he managed to get the tickets. Lin Mu laughs and says he has his ways. If that's settled, they'll all go in three days and he thinks that old man Wang is useful sometimes. They all head out, with Zai Zhu mentioning how they're finally going to eat because she's starving. Lin Mu wonders why the cafeteria is so quiet today. A girl in a white dress remarks that she came to the cafeteria today, finding it odd. Lin Mu looks at her and thinks her body shines, she's a cultivator as well. Zai Zhu asks him if that girl is pretty, and he confirms, adding that he gets the feeling she's a calm-minded person. She playfully hits his foot with hers, and he asks what that was for. She explains that his eyeballs were almost popping out and instructs him to hurry up and get lunch. Lin Mu asks about the girl, and she replies that she has no idea. Miss Song Yuru says she doesn't know either and asks if he fell for her at first sight. He denies it, saying it's just that she feels familiar. She has that aura around her. Miss Song Yuru reassures him, saying not to be mad, and points out that he got front row seats at Yao Zion Zion's concert tonight. Zai Zhu adds that they'll let him off for now because of Yao Zion Zion. Meanwhile, Miss Song Yuru states that she is willing to forgive him for ditching them, and she will drive the group after school. They all arrive at the concert when Zhu Roman 11 announces that they have arrived. She didn't expect Lin Mu to secure such nice seats. Lin Mu expresses amazement, commenting that Yao Zion Zion is truly remarkable. Lin Mu remarks that there are over a thousand police officers patrolling the area, to which Yao Zion Zion responds of course, he's one of the most popular singers. Lin Mu asks, really while Yao Zion Zion appears on stage and greets everyone. She introduces herself, saying she is Yao Zion Zion, and expresses her happiness about being able to perform at Dong Hai. She thanks everyone for their support. The crowd cheers, expressing their love for her. She then acknowledges their appreciation, stating that thanks to them, she can be there that day. 
She expresses her gratitude, mentioning that she would like to dedicate the song Descend of True Love to all her supporters and invites them to enjoy it. After three hours, she remarks that time passes quickly. She adds that the next event is going to be very fun. She expresses her desire to invite a member of the audience to perform with her. She requests the lights, and while searching for a participant, Zai Zhu raises her hand and says she's over here. Yao Zion Zion directs the spotlight toward them and instructs it to stop. The spotlight comes to a halt at Lin Mu, and she announces, please welcome their lucky winner onto the stage. Zai Zhu asks Lin Mu why he isn't going to get on the stage, and he questions why he has to go. She informs him that he's the lucky winner and gets to sing along with Yao Zion Zion. He responds, stating that he doesn't know how to sing. She insists that if he doesn't go, he'll make Yao Zion Zion look bad. He questions what that has to do with him, and she replies that it's up to him. Yao Zion Zion addresses the young man in white, questioning whether he doesn't want to sing with her or if he's too shy. He admits that Miss Yao Zion Zion is correct, as he's too shy to go on stage and can't sing. He expresses his desire to let someone else have the chance. Someone from the crowd applauds, saying nicely and encouraging Yao Zion Zion to pick him. Another person compliments him, saying a good job. Yao Zion Zion agrees and decides to pick another winner. The spotlight stops at another man who becomes excited at the selection and goes on stage to sing with her. He tells her that he loves her and she responds by hugging him, expressing her love as well. She thanks him for all the support and extends her gratitude to everyone present. After a while, they all leave the concert and Zai Zhu comments that the concert was indeed nice. Sadly, her chance of going on stage was taken away from her, otherwise it would have been a perfect concert. A security person approaches Lin Mu and politely informs him that their lady would like to meet him. Lin Mu inquires about the identity of their lady, and the security person responds, Miss Yao Zion Zion. Lin Mu asks why she would want to meet him, to which they reply that they aren't clear on the details, they're just following orders. Lin Mu informs Miss. Song Yuru and Zhu Roman 11 that he'll go for a bit and they can go ahead. He'll take a cab later. Miss Song Yuru advises him to remember to come back safely, and Zai Zhu adds not to forget about them after meeting Yao Zion Zion. Lin Mu instructs the security persons to lead the way, saying, please lead the way. The scene shifts five minutes later, with Lin Mu standing outside the door of Yao Zion Zion's room. He knocks on the door, and she responds that the door is unlocked. He enters, and she comments, well that was quick, as she changes clothes. Upon seeing her, he quickly exits the room apologizing. She reassures him, saying it's alright because she thought it was a staff member. She invites him to come in, mentioning that she's dressed now. Lin Mu asks if there's a reason she wants to see him. She questions why he didn't want to come on stage earlier, and if he thought she would eat him. He responds that he's a young man in his prime, so please find another way to sit. She then asks if he's a gentleman but wonders if he would turn into a wild beast when he looks away. He apologizes but mentions that if Miss Yao Zion Zion doesn't have anything else to say, he will take his leave. As he is about to go out, she gets up, comes closer to him, and says, wait. She moves even closer to him and kisses him on the cheek. Yao Zion Zion retreats and Lin Mu inquires if she's alright. She reassures him, mentioning that she's fine, but expresses that he ran off too quickly as she only wanted to have a chat with him. Lin Mu responds, stating that she's a popular celebrity and he's just a nobody, questioning what there is to talk about. Yao Zion Zion explains that he is the first man to reject her. No man has ever denied her requests. Lin Mu admits that Miss Yao Zion Zion is very attractive, but not all men will fall for it. She finds him interesting because he didn't succumb to her charms, and she confesses to feeling a loss of self-esteem. Lin Mu apologizes if he hurt her confidence and self-esteem, and he states that if that's all, he'll be going. She inquires about his name, remarking that Lin Mu is an interesting name. As he leaves the room and goes to the washroom to clean his face, he realizes he needs to get rid of the lipstick mark. 
He acknowledges that there's no way he can explain this if he gets caught. If he doesn't get home soon, his roommates will be upset again, so he decides to call a taxi. Meanwhile, he goes out and notices someone following him. He asks, who's there? The stranger instructs him to turn around, stating that this way it won't get messy. He complies, raising his hand, and suggests they talk about it. He wants to know why the stranger wants to kill him, as he only wants to understand whom he offended to the point where someone wants him dead. The stranger responds that normally he would tell the truth to a man about to die, but he doesn't want to reveal it after seeing Lin Mu's face. He then takes out his blades and attacks Lin Mu. Lin Mu wonders what the flying knives are and quickly grabs them, apologizing for catching his flying knives. He asks who sent him. The stranger looks away and acknowledges that Lin Mu has some moves. He confesses that he doesn't have the confidence to kill him right now, so he advises Lin Mu to live well because he will come back for his life later. Lin Mu questions why the stranger is leaving without providing an explanation and throws the knives at him. He responds that if Lin Mu takes one step closer, he'll show him how confident he is in killing him. Lin Mu suggests that if that's the case, the stranger should come back when he's 100% confident that he can kill him. Lin Mu reflects that this person is not weaker than him, and the one who hired him must have paid a fortune. However, he wonders who would want him dead at such a high price. He notes that he didn't even use his full power, and if he wasn't careful, he's not sure if he could make it out alive. Despite these thoughts, Lin Mu decides that the mission at hand is to get stronger so that he can capture the stranger the next time they meet and find out who hired him. He concludes that he should head home first. Lin Mu contemplates how careful he was in his actions, yet he continues to draw the attention of assassins. He wonders about this unsettling feeling as he crosses the road, and suddenly, the girl in the white dress appears in front of him. Observing her, he ponders if the feeling is coming from her. She thinks he's the guy from the cafeteria and notices his agitated frost Kai. She wonders if it has something to do with him. Lin Mu, concerned, asks if she's alright and approaches her, thinking he can take the chance to ask her about the issue with her Kai. She, in turn, questions who he is and what he wants. He introduces himself as Lin Mu from the same school, and she runs away. Lin Mu urgently asks where she is going, realizing he can't let her leave without getting to the bottom of this, so he runs after her. He tells her to wait up, emphasizing that he wants to ask her a question. As he chases her, he observes her flying in the air and wonders where she's going. She quickly climbs a huge building. Observing the grace and mastery in the way she moves, he admires her elegance. However, he is determined not to lose to her. He actively tries to find her, intrigued by her extraordinary abilities. The scene shifts two hours later when he is still trying to find her and says, damn it, he has lost her. He looks around and asks, what is this place? He hears a bell ringing and exclaims, a bell rang, there's a temple here. He goes inside the temple and thinks, let's go check it out, while people are praying outside the temple. He thinks there is a wave of Kai coming from inside. What is this place? He sees a golden Buddhist aura and thinks he has a glowing aura around him. He wonders if his eyes are lying to him. The great monk gets up and comes closer to him, welcoming him, while Lin Mu thinks about what happened. He appears in his face in the blink of an eye. The great monk states that he has been standing here for an hour now and asks how he can be of assistance. He replies that he was just lost in his thoughts, apologizing for bothering him and expressing the hope that he'll forgive him as he bows down in front of him. He thinks this kind of monk has a non-mortal aura around him. He did not think that he would be attracted to it. The great monk responds, not at all. He sees that he has a kind heart. He says please follow him. He replies, please lead the way, and asks the great monk where this place is. The great monk explains that this is the place where he meditates on Buddhist enlightenment. Lin Mu thinks this is the place where the monk cultivates, and it feels like he's in a dream, wondering if this is the true body of Buddha from the legends. Amitabha Buddha states that he sees this young sir as kind and notes that he has not committed a major sin. He possesses a set of techniques that can aid in his cultivation. 
Lin Mu expresses gratitude to Buddha for this, and in response, Amitabha Buddha instructs him to come closer. Amitabha Buddha performs some magic on him, while the monk expresses surprise, stating that he didn't expect this young man to receive such a great gift from Buddha. Additionally, the monk bows down in front of Amitabha Buddha and prays. The scene shifts to the next day, where Lin Mu wakes up and wonders if it was all a dream. He touches his forehead and realizes he has a big headache. This is definitely from the knowledge and spiritual energy. He questions if it's morning already and if he spent the night here. A great monk arrives and wishes him good morning. Lin Mu reciprocates the greeting and expresses gratitude for the generous gift. The great monk states that kindness has no limits and hopes he can treasure the teachings of Buddha. He replies that he has learned a lot and is a great master. The scene shifts to the afternoon at Dong Hai University. Lin Mu mentions that in today's class, they will discuss anti-derivatives. He reflects on the temple he visited yesterday, known for its evil resisting seals. He believes that random kindness and respect go a long way, but unfortunately, the technique he encountered is too powerful for him to learn in his current state. He lacks the spiritual energy and Kai necessary to use it, although he is confident it will prove useful in the future. Lin Mu notes that he reached the spirit gathering stage earlier than expected, surpassing his original plan of spending a year or so to achieve it. He acknowledges the significant help he received from the sliver of Kai acquired during his rebirth, allowing him to breeze through the foundation building stage. Lin Mu believes he started directly at the spirit sensing stage due to that. With the newfound technique, he has progressed to the spirit gathering stage and things are going well for him. He reflects that being in the spirit gathering realm means he is several times stronger than he was in the foundation building realm. Meanwhile, Lin Mu laughs and looks at his notebook, thinking, damn it, he forgot he was still in class. The professor notices him and asks if he thinks the class is very funny. Lin Mu apologizes, says sorry, and leaves the class. In frustration, he punches the wall, realizing he has truly lost himself if he found happiness in reaching the spirit gathering stage. He questions how he can live up to his name as the strongest cultivator in this state. Feeling a strong connection, he declares this feeling it has to be her and spots the girl in the white dress. Lin Mu believes that after reaching the spirit gathering stage, he can sense her from a great distance. Determined, he decides he must get to the bottom of this, he can't let her get away this time. Jai King Lan asks him again, just who the hell is he? He replies that his name is Lin Mu and inquires about her name. She responds that her name is Jai King Lan. Lin Mu then questions why, when they are close, their Kai seems to react to each other, and if she wants to find out the reason. She remarks that it seems like he's as clueless as she is, but states that it really won't do if this continues. She suggests they come with her to a quiet place where they can investigate what's causing their Kai to react to each other. The scene shifts to half an hour later, and they both arrive in a forest where she indicates that they're there. Lin Mu asks what they can do now, and she admits she's not too sure either, asking if he has any ideas. Lin Mu thinks for a moment and suggests trying to connect their Kai together to see what will happen, prompting them to sit down. She agrees and also sits down in front of him. They touch their hands together while he instructs her to focus on her breathing. Lin Mu reflects on this feeling, noting that their Kai is cooperating much better. She finds it strange that her Frost Kai is much more refined than before. He observes that her Kai is indeed more refined now, just like his, but wonders about the kind of technique she is cultivating, as it carries a slight chill. Both of them feel better, and he remarks that it seems like their Kai has become purer. She agrees, mentioning that her Frost Kai feels a lot stronger now. Meanwhile, he realizes that he was cultivating Frost Kai, explaining why it felt so cold. He believes that continuing this cultivation would be beneficial for them, sensing something deeper. She confirms and suggests they do it once more, but this time, let the Kai fuse more. She proposes fusing as one again, and they touch their hands once more. The scene shifts one hour later, and they remain in the same position. 
Suddenly, they teleport to another place, and a notification appears stating that with the alignment of the stars, Lin Mu and Jai King Lan have been teleported into a different realm. Lin Mu reflects on the dense Kai in this new place, feeling everything around him. He opens his eyes and looks at her, realizing that she is now nude. Shocked, she wonders what happened, feeling so refreshed. Lin Mu blushes and quickly assures her that he didn't see anything. She looks at her body, noticing her state, and angrily accuses him of being a pervert. Jai King Lan slaps Lin Mu, and he explains that it was actually Jai King Lan who woke up. It was just an illusion. She hides her body with her hands and questions what illusion means. After examining her clothes, she comments that it felt so real. Lin Mu asks if it was because of the Kai fusion that they were able to sense the divine consciousness in advance. She inquires if the Kai fusion caused it. Lin Mu confirms and explains that Kai fusion has three stages, with the divine territory following the initial gathering of Kai. He adds that upon reaching the divine territory, the divine consciousness is created, and it is through this divine consciousness that they can suddenly become naked. Jai King Lan reflects on her insights into the realm of cultivation, concluding that it was indeed the divine consciousness. Curious about his identity, she asks if his name is Lin Mu, and he confirms, asking what's up. She then directly asks if he has a girlfriend. Surprised, he questions what a girlfriend is and why she is asking. Irritated, she insists he just tells her if he has one or not. He quickly replies that no, he doesn't have a girlfriend. Meanwhile, she asks really? He responds affirmatively, stating that he really doesn't have a girlfriend and questioning why he would lie to her. She warns him not to lie, otherwise she won't let him leave. Puzzled, he asks why she is asking this question. She explains that her grandmother said to whom he gives his body, to whom he must marry, and if she can't marry him, she must kill him. He replies that his grandfather does have a good point, emphasizing that girls should wait, and he's not going to marry her because she didn't give him her body. Suddenly, she transforms into a monster and declares that he must take responsibility for her since he has seen her body and taken her innocence. Terrified, he insists that he won't do this claiming that it was just an illusion created by the divine consciousness and doesn't count. She challenges him, asking if he thinks she doesn't know what the divine consciousness is and whether what he saw through the divine consciousness is more real than what is seen by the naked eye. She reveals that their family also had a master of the divine territory, and she has seen the records left behind. He realizes that he can't fool her. She insists that in any case, he must marry her. In response, he states that marriage is a very serious matter, questioning what they should do if they don't match each other. She mentions that her grandpa said if she marry a chicken, follow the chicken. If she marry a dog, follow the dog. And if she marry a beggar, then follow the beggar. He observes that her grandpa taught her a lot of things and asks what else he taught her. She reveals that her grandpa advised her not to get married too early, suggesting she wait until after she graduates. Until then, she should try her best to be nice and get along with her boyfriend. He reflects that he initially thought she was going to insist on getting married today, but fortunately, it's after graduation. Observing that Jai King Lan disappeared into the mountains, leaving Lin Mu to descend and return home alone, he reflects on how becoming someone's wife seems to be decided so easily nowadays. He comments that girls these days are too casual about these things, finding the world of mortals truly annoying. He decides that he should just focus on cultivation instead. While lost in thought, he notices someone running towards him and wonders if it's an assassin. A punk approaches and instructs him to get out of the way, shouting at him to move. He steps aside, realizing that the punk isn't after him, and watches as the punk runs away. He ponders if the guy is doing sprinting exercises and seems to be in a hurry. Lin Mu recognizes the person as police officer Wang from before and contemplates if she is also exercising. He thinks about the challenges of being a police officer, practicing sprinting every day. However, he notes that the guy from before seems to be more energetic. Suddenly, he recalls something wrong when the man passed by him, his eyes shone. 
Meanwhile, he acknowledges that it was the same look he had seen so many times on his path of cultivation. He admits that although it isn't comparable to those of real experts, it was filled with murderous intent. He wonders if it could be a robber, or if she is chasing after a criminal. Hearing gunshots he exclaims, it's not good, those are gunshots. He shouts in frustration, realizing that he has become careless and let a criminal slip by him so easily. Determined, he runs behind them, noting that the gunshots should have come from over there. As he approaches, he sees a police officer fall down, and the punk points a gun towards him. He acknowledges that he didn't want to kill her, but he also can't let her catch him. The police officer says she knows he won't run. Lin Mu gets closer to her and asks if she's alright as he holds her in his arms. He thinks about the location of the wound, wondering if it's the heart. Then, he corrects himself, judging from the amount of blood loss, realizing the bullet must have just missed the heart, a fortunate circumstance. However, he acknowledges that the current situation isn't much better. He says, rest assured, the bullet hasn't hit any of her vitals, so she'll be just fine. She recognizes him and asks what he is doing here, and he says he has to go and tells her not to worry about her. He hugs her and says, stop talking, placing her hand over her wound and adding pressure. He gets up and goes behind that punk while she asks what he is going to do and tells him to stay back because he has a gun. He replies to hold on a little longer. Once he has dealt with this guy, then he'll take her to the hospital. She asks if he is crazy while he walks towards that punk, laughs, and says he wants to act like some hero or he's seeking death and says he has seen too many movies. He'll show him the cold, hard truth of reality and shoot him. He says, go to hell. The scene shifts to a public security bureau in Donghai City, where Lin Mu tells the officer that the series of events took place and that he will be leaving now if nothing else. The officer says, wait a moment. He asks if there is anything else, and then he replies that thanks to his help, Wang Ziking was able to make it to the hospital in time. Lin Mu replies that he just did what anyone should do. The scene shifts three hours later to Dong Hai City's People's First Hospital. The doctor says the patient is currently undergoing surgery, and the family should wait outside. He mentions that he misunderstood and wonders why they haven't come out yet. He thinks it seems the situation isn't very good, and says they're coming out. The doctor advises them to be careful while he looks at them and thinks she wouldn't be in this state if he had just reacted a little faster. Doctor, she asks Officer Wang how she is feeling and says the anesthetic hasn't worn off yet, so she can't hear her. Meanwhile, Lin Mu asks Dr. Pui Zhu about the situation with Officer Wang. She replies that the operation was successful, and the patient is currently out of danger. He mentions that he has something he wants to say to her and asks if he can go in and see Officer Wang. She replies that Officer Wang has just come out of surgery and needs some rest, so he can come back tomorrow to see her. Lin Mu insists that it's very important, and he'll have to trouble her to let him through. He adds please, he promises he'll be quick. She agrees, saying that she will catch up on her break in about 10 minutes and reminds him to keep it short. 10 minutes later, he thanks her and knocks on the door. He says to Officer Wang that he has come to see her, and he enters the room. He asks Officer Wang how he knew his name. She replies, comes on, she is a cop, and inquires about whether the scoundrel was apprehended, expressing concern that he's unharmed. She also asks about his well-being, and he starts coughing. He responds, informing her that she's just out of surgery and advising her to take it easy. He thinks it appears that she doesn't know how he dealt with the guy which will save him a lot of trouble. The scene shifts to a few hours ago when he was bleeding profusely and lost consciousness. He tells the punk that he isn't that skilled at shooting. The punk asks why he can't hit the guy. The punk asks what happened and why he didn't hit him. He realizes he's out of bullets, puts his gun down, and demands to know who Lin Mu is. Lin Mu approaches, punches the punk, and asserts that he doesn't need to know who he is, rendering the punk unconscious. Lin Mu believes that the force he used should not have taken the punk's life, but he worries that Officer Wang has lost too much blood and fainted. 
Checking her pulse, he observes that it's weak and decides he needs to get her to the hospital immediately. The scene shifts to the present, where Lin Mu stands near her. He recounts encountering a strong man in his underwear and punching a gangster in the chest, causing the gangster to fall unconscious. He reflects that if he hadn't shown up in time, both of them would have been dead. Meanwhile, she inquires about what he means by a strong guy in his underwear and wonders if he also has a red cape. She dismisses the superhero story as too much, expressing frustration that he won't tell her the truth and starts coughing again. He insists that Officer Wang should stop talking. She attempts to say something again, but is interrupted by a severe fit of coughing. He wonders if this world also has immortal heroes and if she has actually found out. He tells her that he brought her something good and gives her a pill, saying, eat this. She asks what it is, and he reassures her that it won't hurt her. She eats it and warns him that she won't forgive him if anything happens. Dr. Kutha Zhu arrives and informs Lin Mu that Officer Wang's family has arrived. He acknowledges this and decides to leave, walking out as Officer Wang thanks him for the medicine and says goodbye. He responds by wishing her a speedy recovery and promising to come see her in a few days. After a while, Officer Wang's father asks about the condition of their daughter and her mother inquires if she is alright. Dr. Sitha Zhu reassures them that there is no need to worry, Officer Wang is already out of danger. She invites them to go inside her room, and they enter. Lin Mu informs Dr. Paju that he'll be leaving, but she asks him to wait. He inquires if there is anything else. She questions the medicine he gave to the patient, expressing concern that he might be causing trouble by administering random medication to their patients. Lin Mu assures her, stating that it's only vitamin C. He believes he's the one who refined the medicine, emphasizing its miraculous effects during the treatment of injuries. Although it wasn't easy to refine, he considers it worth it to save other people's lives. Lin Mu announces that he'll be visiting again in a few days, bids farewell and leaves. Dr. Pan Zhu, however, senses that something is wrong. She reflects that this isn't how Lin Mu was previously and concludes that the real Lin Mu must have died back then. She wonders about the identity of the current Lin Mu. The next morning, Ms. Song Yuru announces that breakfast is ready, and they all sit down to eat. She expresses how delicious Lin Mu's food is, stating that she wants to keep eating it for as long as she lives. Zai Zhu then brings up the question of why Lin Mu came home so late the previous night. Lin Mu dismisses it, saying that he simply ran into an old classmate and they kept talking until it got late. Zai Zhu, skeptical, asks if that's really what happened. Lin Mu questions why he would lie about it. The girl with long hair laughs it off, noting that she tends to ask a lot of questions. Miss Song Yuru adds that it's true and suggests having some fun that night. Lin Mu hesitates, mentioning the classmate's birthday party, but the long-haired girl insists that he should join them, as he might get bored alone at home. With that, it's decided that he will go with them to the birthday party. As they drive to the birthday party, Zai Zhu asks him if they haven't met in a long time, wondering if he remembered them. Meanwhile, the girl with long hair reminisces about high school, mentioning how they used to talk about everything during that time. She expresses regret that, after high school, due to her family responsibilities, their conversations gradually dwindled. Yes. Song Yuru acknowledges that there was nothing they could do and points out that she is a different kind of person compared to them. As they arrive at dusk, Zai Zhu announces their arrival at the Princeton Hotel. They all enter the elevator, and the girl with long hair presses the button for the 19th floor. Lin Mu asks if her classmate Sidu Zhu is wealthy. The girl with long hair explains that the Sidhu family has been a powerful and distinguished family for five to six hundred years, extending beyond mere wealth. Upon reaching the 19th floor, they encounter a lively party with a large number of attendees. Lin Mu reflects on how it truly lives up to the reputation of an old and distinguished family, considering the grand scale of the birthday celebration. After a while, a man in a grey dress approaches and asks if she is the eldest daughter of the Song family. He expresses surprise that she attended MS, Sidhu's birthday soiree, and requests her to honor him by drinking a glass. 
Sobs, Song Yuru apologizes, stating that she doesn't recognize him. Meanwhile, Lin Mu begins to feel a strange sensation, identifying it as the true King Kai. He wonders who the powerful individual emitting the true King Kai might be. Glancing around, he spots a beautiful girl and realizes that she is the source of the true King Kai. Perplexed, he questions why the true King Kai is emanating from a girl. The girl notices his impolite gaze and playfully refers to him as Mr. Tsubete, handsome. Lin Mu contemplates the existence of telepathy in this world, marveling at the number of experts possessing such abilities in a realm with thin spiritual Kai. He finds it intriguing. Song Yuru asks Lin Mu what he is looking at, and he replies nothing. Let's find a place to sit first. The white dress girl suggests sitting here, and they all sit at a table. Zaizu asks which girl Lin Mu saw that left him spellbound. He refuses to answer while the older man instructs everyone to quiet down. Zaizu recognizes Sidu Ziyu, and Lin Mu acknowledges that he always looks at her. He says so she's Sidu Ziyu. Lin Mu is surprised that Sidu Ziyu can emit the Kai of the true king. Sidu Ziyu wonders about the telepathy and is surprised that he knows her family's secret technique. She expresses gratitude for everyone attending the young Miss's birthday, thanking them for taking time out of their busy schedules. She hopes everyone present can experience a joyous evening, and the crowd wishes her a happy birthday. Meanwhile, Lin Mu realizes that she can also use charms, while the old man asks if those guests who have prepared gifts can please come forward to present them personally. A queue forms as people give her gifts, and a person presents her gift, saying Miss Sidhu really can use telepathy and charms. He's truly fortunate to have met her today. She holds his hands and modestly responds that he has overpraised her. Another person comes on stage, gives her a gift, and wishes her a happy birthday. He adds that it is a token of his company's regard, requesting her to accept it kindly. She graciously takes the gift, thanking him for his generosity. Lin Mu inquires about Miss Song Yuru's and others' presents, questioning why they haven't started presenting them yet. Miss Song Yuru explains that only valuable gifts should be personally presented to the host. For ordinary gifts, there is no need to go on stage. Instead, they can be given to a representative. He acknowledges the explanation, expressing surprise at the level of detail people have about gift giving. He then stands up and asks if everyone can wait, as he also wants to present a gift to Miss Situ Ziyu. The white-dressed girl asks if he has come empty-handed and questions what he plans to give. He walks towards the stage and announces that someone with a generous gift would like to present it to Miss Situ Ziyu personally. However, the guards stop him, noting that his hands are empty. They explain that his generous gift consists of a few words that he would like to offer to Miss Sidhu Ziyu, which they believe will make her feel comfortable. The guests laugh at him, with one person commenting that this boy must be crazy. Another person expresses disbelief, wondering if they heard correctly, referring to a few words as a generous gift. Zaizu comments on the embarrassment, stating that Sidhu Ziyu isn't easy to deal with, and it seems he is about to be humiliated. Sidhu Ziyu, however, graciously acknowledges the gentleman's generous gift and expresses gratitude. She assures him she will listen attentively, curious to see what trick he will play. One of the guests asks what on earth those priceless words could be. Another person remarks that everyone listens with great attention and laughs at him. Lin Mu responds, stating that these secrets cannot be shared with anyone, and he requests Miss Situ Ziyu to come a bit closer. The old man mentions that Miss Situ has already given him enough face by agreeing to hear his words and advises him not to take one step forward and then two steps back. Situ Ziyu wonders about his intentions, thinking that this person's skills seem limitless, and she says it's no problem, allowing him to come up. The old man, acknowledging her consent, tells him to go up. Expressing gratitude, he goes on stage and whispers in her ear. A person from the audience comments that this audacious boy has the nerve to get close to Miss Situ Ziyu, predicting that he'll make a fool out of himself and pay the price. Lin Mu explains that these words should be considered a birthday present for a Miss Situ Ziyu, hoping she can put them to good use. 
She smiles and thanks, saying she can't thank him enough for his teachings. Meanwhile, an individual asks what this situation is, what he said, and how this happened. Lin Mu walks towards Miss Song Yuru and others, asking what's wrong. His expressions are unsightly. Miss Song Yuru explains that he almost scared them to death, and Zhu Roman Eleven adds that they thought he would be humiliated in front of everyone. Lin Mu apologizes, acknowledging that he made them all worried. Situ Yuru approaches their table, greets everyone, and mentions they meet again. Situ Ziyu observes that this gentleman seems to be their friend, but she still doesn't know how to address him. Lin Mu stands up from his seat and introduces himself as Lin Mu. Situ Ziyu expresses her pleasure at meeting him, and he reciprocates the sentiment. Zai Roman Eleven inquires about what they are both doing and jokingly asks if she is acting for a martial arts film. Situ Ziyu laughs, saying that Zai Roman Eleven is still funny, and she encourages him to take his time eating. She mentions that she has some things to care for, so she has to go now. The scene shifts to Situ family residence at night, where Situ Ziyu arrives at her father's room and says dad, she has returned. Her dad inquires if she is happy with tonight's dinner party. She responds of course that she's happy and expresses her desire to discuss something with him. She reveals that she no longer wants to return to the capital to study and asks if he can reassign her to Dong Hai. She wants to study at Dong Hai University. Her dad questions the sudden change, reminding her that she was initially insistent on going to the capital for studies. She explains that she has changed her decision and wants to stay in Dong Hai with her dad. He asks if she genuinely plans on spending more time with him, to which she confirms. Her father laughs and says that if she truly thinks this way, he is genuinely happy. She reflects on the four sentences he gave her, considering them as gems for pointing out the issues surrounding her cultivation in such a short period. She also finds Lin Mu interesting. The scene shifts to Karate Hall, where James Yaju is practicing and asks his students if they are ready. They reply that they are prepared, and he announces he is coming. He runs to attack them, effortlessly knocking them out in one hit. Despite their minimal resistance, he declares that he hasn't finished yet, noting that their meager strength makes it impossible for them to stand up. One of his disciples apologizes and gets up, while James Yaju extends a hand to another disciple, encouraging them to stand up and continue practicing. They all prepare for practice again, and he mentions it's time to try another person. The scene then shifts to Dong Hai University, where Lin Mu approaches his class and spots Jai Kian Lan. He asks if it is her, while two other students whisper that they were wondering why it felt so cold. It turns out the Ice Queen, Jai Kian Lan, is here. She calls Lin Mu and says he's here. Come here, she needs to talk to him. He replies what's the matter and why can't they talk here. She grabs his hand and takes him with her while he asks what she is doing. She shouts stop talking, just walk with her, and it's not like she'll eat him. The other students are irritated, and someone remarks that it turns out she can also like males. They comment that Lin Mu is taking three campus bells for himself, not even leaving Jai Kai and Lan for them. Another student adds that if he's handsome and good at martial arts, he can do whatever he likes. Lin Mu asks her what the matter is, noting her strange behavior. She replies that her dad wants to meet him and that he should visit her house tonight. He asks why her dad wants to meet him and what he wants with her. She explains that she had told her father about what happened earlier and he expressed a desire to meet his future son-in-law. Lin Mu questions why she told her family so quickly as they had agreed to wait. She asks if he's backing out and he reassures her to calm down, he'll go. She responds that's better, just as someone interrupts, apologizes, and asks if he is Mr. Lin Mu. Jai Kian Lan and Lin Mu walk towards school, and she asks him to slow down a bit. She mentions that James Yaju is undefeated at Dong Hai University and asks if he has any problem with that. He replies, asking what's meant by undefeated, and finds it interesting. He thinks that after reaching the foundation building stage, he's worried that there won't be a suitable person to practice with, and he hopes Yaju won't disappoint him. 
The scene shifts to half an hour ago where James Yaju arrives near both of them in the forest. He introduces himself as Dong Hai University's Karate Club president and expresses a desire to challenge Mr. Deus Lin Mu that day. Jai Kayan Lan states that she doesn't care if he's James Yaju and asks if he can't see that she has business to discuss with Lin Mu. He apologizes for disturbing them but adds that if Lin Mu won't accept the challenge, he won't mind. Jai Kayan Lan becomes angry and asks what if he doesn't accept. Lin Mu, however, accepts the challenge. James Yaju expresses gratitude and sets the time for the challenge at 6 p.m. in the school gym. Lin Mu states that regarding Mr. Q James Yaju's strength, he knows what he's doing, assuring everyone that he can definitely beat him. Jai Kayan Lan replies, advising him not to say that too early. Carelessly wanting to fight his enemy may lead to significant losses, regardless, he is still her fiancé. She doesn't want to see him make a fool out of himself in front of everyone. At 6 p.m., Lin Mu arrives at the school gym, where one student remarks that they've heard the person the president has challenged today is very strong. Another student reassures, saying not to worry. No matter how strong, he still won't be able to defeat their president. A female student notices Lin Mu's arrival and mentions it. Another student comments, so he's Lin Mu, he's so handsome. Lin Mu wonders why everyone is looking at him, and a student observes that the person the president challenged is him, and he looks so fragile. Before their showdown, Lin Mu expresses his desire to ask Mr. Kina James Yaju some questions. He asks why James Yaju wants a duel with him. James Yaju replies that it's because he's Mr. Curls Lai Guangrui's friend, and he heard that Lin Mu defeated him easily. This implies that his strength is significant, clarifying that he doesn't want to avenge him. Lin Mu asks who Lai Guangrui is and recalls the person who was both harassing and pursuing his teacher. James Yaju replies that, on his martial arts journey, he has always pursued the strong, and it's only because Lin Mu isn't an ordinary talent that he hopes they can learn from each other. Lin Mu says he understands now, and since they're learning from each other, he won't go too hard. James Yaju responds, insisting that Lin Mu not go easy on him, as he always goes all out when exchanging blows, and this is to respect his opponents. Lin Mu agrees, inviting him to enlighten him. James Yaju responds likewise, making his moves and running to attack. Lin Mu considers that Yaju is indeed several times stronger than Le Guangrui, and he realizes he is still far from Yaju's level. As he moves to attack, Lin Mu quickly sidesteps. Someone from the audience suggests, let's go and kill him, while another observes that President Yaju has suppressed Lin Mu to the point where he can't counterattack. Jai King Lan looks at them and thinks that unfamiliar onlookers might believe Lin Mu is being suppressed to the extent of being unable to return blows, appearing to be at a complete disadvantage. However, she notes that Lin Mu's steps are ruthlessly organized as if he's playing with Yaju and letting him deplete his strength. President Yaju moves to kick, but Lin Mu skillfully evades, thinking it was close and he almost gets kicked. President Yaju questions why Lin Mu is only defending himself and asks if it could be that he's looking down on him. Lin Mu apologizes, explaining that he was meticulously studying Mr. K Yaju's martial arts and almost forgot they were dueling. While defending, he also had enough energy to analyze Yaju's moves. Lin Mu declares that from now on, he's going to go all out and Mr. Tid Yaju better be ready. He challenges Yaju to come at him and let him experience it. Quickly moving toward Yaju's chest, Lin Mu hits and pushes him away, leaving everyone shocked. A black-haired person expresses confusion, stating that he only saw the instant when Lin Mu suddenly appeared in front of President Yaju. Another person asks what just happened. Jai King Lan comments on the astonishing speed, understanding why Lin Mu has already gained a reputation. President Yaju admits he was careless, while Lin Mu reflects that he only released a trifle of essential Kai, and Yaju can't get up. Lin Mu thinks that the plan to use himself to test the power of his foundation building stage has fallen through. This is so disappointing. President Yaju believes that in that recent hit, he just experienced the disparity between Lin Mu and himself. 
he asserts that he won't easily give up. Lin Mu reflects that President Yaju actually awakened his combative spirit, but in the end, it won't matter. He moves to attack, determined to hit him this time and make it count. Lin Mu quickly sidesteps and grabs Yaju's hand, asking what on earth he is. Lin Mu informs him that he is just like him, merely a student at Donghai University. He apologizes and delivers a hard punch, knocking Yaju out. He acknowledges that this power is clearly that of a monster. The scene shifts to Jai's family mansion in the evening. Jai King Lan introduces Lin Mu to her grandfather, saying, This is Lin Mu. Her grandfather asks about Lin Mu's future plans with King Lan. Lin Mu replies that, at the moment, he hasn't thought about it. The grandfather questions whether Lin Mu has any plans to marry Jai King Lan, or if he is playing with her feelings. Lin Mu clarifies that he doesn't mean it that way, he wants to graduate and look for a job first. He suggests to King Lan that neither of them has concrete plans for the future and asks if they think marriage is just a game. She responds by pointing out that they still have another two years before they graduate from school, so there's no need to rush. The grandfather expresses concern about Lin Mu's attitude, stating that once they graduate and start working, what will happen if Lin Mu runs away? He warns King Lan about the potential consequences, mentioning stories of guys fooling around with girls. He emphasizes that as a girl, she stands to lose in such situations. Lin Mu finds himself in a situation he doesn't want at all. Jai King Lan insists on dragging him here, and now he is the one being reprimanded. Addressing King Lan, he expresses his lack of understanding and questions why she is interested in such a man. He insists he has no plans at all, emphasizing that this kind of man is not worthy enough to be with her. King Lan tries to defend Lin Mu, stating that he is not what the others think he is. He interrupts, saying that he will never agree to this marriage. Lin Mu excuses himself. He admits that he does not have any concrete plans for the future at the moment and does not plan on explaining it. He mentions that he is still in the midst of preparing for his future and questions how he could easily make promises to others at such a time. Standing up, Lin Mu apologizes for causing upset and declares that he will never come here again. He moves to leave, bidding farewell. King Lan calls him and asks him to wait. The grandfather remarks to King Lan that a petty and narrow-minded man like him won't amount to anything extraordinary in the future. Trusting her grandfather, she gives up on Lin Mu. She calls Lin Mu again and pleads with him not to leave. Sobbing, she tells her grandfather that he doesn't know anything at all, and then she goes. King Lan's father admits to his father that he may have spoken too harshly earlier. He acknowledges that the Lin family may be something, but they are still too weak when compared to the Jai family. He clarifies that he was testing Lin Mu to see if he's only courting King Lan because of their family fortunes. He adds that if Lin Mu had ill intentions, he would have expected him to swallow his pride and try to appease him. He expresses surprise that Lin Mu was easily offended by his words, acknowledging that since Lin Mu did not have any ill intentions, it's normal for a young man like him to be prideful. He reflects that if he were in Lin Mu's position, he would be upset as well. Standing up, he concludes that, with his current state, Lin Mu won't be able to stay long in the Jai family if he marries King Lan. He states that unless Lin Mu changes, he won't agree to this marriage. King Lan's father believes his father is too stubborn, he won't change his mind no matter what he says. Personally, he thinks Lin Mu is a fine man, and he hopes that with time, Lin Mu's character will change for the better. Meanwhile, Lin Mu reflects on how he has faced so much in the world of cultivation, and nothing was able to disturb his composure. He can't believe he got angry so quickly today, wondering if he has become a petty person. He dismisses this idea thinking that it must be because the owner of this body is a petty person, and he was affected by it. He contemplates what's so great about the Jai family and feels indignant that they dare to look down on him. He decides that he can't stay low profile in the future. Suddenly, he hears Xing Wai Long's voice asking for help. Looking at him, he thinks the fat guy looks familiar. Recalling a previous encounter where he teased a student, he asks Xing Wai Long where he is going. 
The student apologizes, and Lin Mu realizes that he is the school bully, Zing Wai Long. Curious, Lin Mu asks what has gotten him so excited in the middle of the night. Zing Wai Long, being pursued by a group of men with bats, exclaims that he is saved. The men threaten him to stop right there, claiming he is dead meat. Lin Mu questions how a bully like Zing Wai Long ended up being chased. Zing Wai Long explains that they are his classmates and pleads with Lin Mu to save him, asserting that he is going to die tonight if not rescued. The pursuers clarify that they only want Zing Wai Long and instruct Lin Mu to get lost if he values his life. Zing Wai Long mentions that he was able to defeat Liu Sheng, so these hooligans won't be his match, pleading for Lin Mu to save him. Lin Mu agrees, stating that he is in a bad mood and needs to vent it out. The man in the black shirt questions why Lin Mu is still hanging around. Lin Mu apologizes, stating that he's his classmate and can't stand by without help. Dismissing Lin Mu's explanation, the man orders his accomplice to go after both of them. The accomplice moves to attack Lin Mu with a knife, declaring that since he wishes to die, they will grant him his wish. Lin Mu, confident that these hooligans pose no challenge to him, tells Zing Wai Long to be careful, as they are merciless killers. Lin Mu decides that he should make them feel some pain without causing fatalities. He moves to attack, stating that it will be much more challenging without causing any deaths. Addressing him, Lin Mu mentions that since he likes to steal attention, he should try this on him first. Observing Lin Mu's moves, Zing Wai Long asks if he is serious. Lin Mu successfully hits one of the men, who screams in pain. Lin Mu confirms that it worked. Zing Wai Long, astonished, asks if this isn't only seen in martial arts movies. The next day, Lin Mu walks along the road, and Zing Wai Long calls out from behind. Lin Mu turns to see him and acknowledges that it's him. Zing Wai Long expresses gratitude for saving his life the previous night and declares that from now on, anything that bothers Lin Mu is his problem as well, and he'll do everything he can to help. Lin Mu downplays it, saying it's just a simple matter, and Zing Wai Long doesn't need to worry about it. Zing Wai Long insists that it may be a simple matter to Lin Mu, but he saved his life. He bows and asks Lin Mu to accept his gesture declaring that from now on, he, Zing Wai Long, is his follower. Lin Mu tells him to get up and inquires about the identity of the men who were trying to kill him. Zing Wai Long explains that they are from the Anjai Gang, and he had offended Pai Hong Zing, a leader of one of their branches, which is why they wanted his life. Just then, a passing brown-haired man urges them to hurry up and take a look. His friend mentions that something interesting is happening at the school entrance. Zing Wai Long stops him and asks what's going on and why everyone is rushing to see. He explains that it's big news. Jai King Lan is going to fight someone, and he heard her opponent is beautiful as well. Lin Mu wonders why she would get into a fight with someone. Zing Wai Long suggests to Lin Mu that they should go take a look as well. Lin Mu replies that he's not interested and can go on his own. Zing Wai Long grabs his arm and suggests that since they have nothing else to do, they should go take a look. Lin Mu tells him to stop dragging him, he can walk on his own. Meanwhile, at the school entrance, a student asks what's going on. The other replies that they do not know, they have been standing like this for a while. Another suggests they hurry up and start fighting instead of just standing there. Zing Wai Long arrives and says, excuse him, let him through. Lin Mu notices a girl and calls her Miss Situ. She looks at him, and he asks what she is doing there. She replies they meet again. A cap-wearing student is shocked and asks if she actually knows Lin Mu. He wonders why all the pretty girls seem to know him. Jai King Lan warns Lin Mu to be careful, mentioning that this woman has been asking around for his whereabouts. She suspects that she's trying to plot something against him. Ms. Situ responds by saying that he is such a lucky guy to have such a pretty girl protecting him. Lin Mu clarifies to King Lan that she is mistaken. Mm, Situ is not a bad person, and they know each other. Zing Wai Long announces to everyone that if they hear that, it's just a misunderstanding and instructs them to stop looking and disperse. 
Lin Mu then questions Miss Situ about why she is at Eastern Sea College. She explains that she is transferred here from Capital College. King Lan, surprised, notes that Capital College is one of the top colleges in Huazia and wonders why Miss Situ would give up studying there to transfer here. King Lan asks about her motive, to which Miss Situ responds that of course she has a motive, and from now on, they are classmates, so she asks them to take good care of her. Some students observed M. Sidhu's picture on the phone, and a student in a blue shirt commented, What a beautiful girl. Another student remarks that it looks like the owner of the title of the school beauty is going to change. Meanwhile, Ms. Sidhu sits with Zai Roman 11 and Ms. Song Yuru. She inquires about Jai King Lan's background. Ms. Song Yuru informs her that Jai King Lan is the famous ice queen of the school, describing her as someone who seems cold. At the same time, Jai King Lan gives a gift to Lin Mu and suggests they have lunch together. Ms. Situ remarks that Jai King Lan doesn't look like a cold person and appears pretty friendly. Lin Mu expresses gratitude but mentions he won't be able to finish all of the food. Zai Roman 11 adds that Jai King Lan is only friendly to Lin Mu. Anyone else would freeze up from her stare. Ms. Situ jokingly suggests that she's the love rival for Lin Mu. Zai Roman 11 denies it, stating that it's rubbish, and the white-dressed girl agrees, saying they wouldn't like a man like him. Ms. Song Yuru expresses disbelief, and Miss Situ reassures them that it was just a joke. Just then, a guard comes and asks if he is Lin Mu. Jai King Lan questions what the problem is and why he cannot see that they are about to have lunch. The guard apologizes for disturbing his meal, but explains that they have an emergency and their head officer would like to discuss something with Mr. Lin. Lin Mu thinks the man is well built and refined, but it seems he's not here to cause trouble. He inquires about the head officer, and Jai King Lan questions why the head officer can't come on his own. Lin Mu tells King Lan not to make things difficult for them, as it might be a real emergency, and he assures her that he will be back shortly. The guard expresses gratitude for Lin Mu's understanding and asks him to follow. King Lan advises him to be careful, and he reassures her, saying not to worry and asks if she doesn't trust his skills. They come out and the guard tells him to please hold on while he informs others. He goes near the car and informs them that Lin Mu is there. Officer Wang's father instructs him to get in the car, and Lin Mu complies. In the car, Officer Wang's father asks if he still remembers him. Lin Mu replies that if he didn't remember wrongly, he is Officer Wang's father. He acknowledges seeing him once and appreciates the compliment about young people having good memories. Lin Mu expresses gratitude, and he thanks him for taking care of Kinger. Lin Mu dismisses the formality, stating that Officer Wang is his friend. Since they are friends, it's only normal for him to help when she's in trouble. Lin Mu then inquires about her recovery, and Officer Wang's father informs him that she's recovering well and has invited him to visit when he is free. Lin Mu assures him that he will definitely pay her a visit in a few days. He appreciates the promise, and Lin Mu asks if there is something else that prompted this visit, urging him to speak freely. He agrees and comes straight to the point, explaining what happened. Officer Wang's father tells Lin Mu that if he had other choices, he wouldn't have looked for him. Lin Mu replies, saying that he may have agreed to help, but he's not a doctor. Officer Wang's father insists that he should do his best, and if he needs anything, he can feel free to tell them. Another officer asks why he isn't here yet, and Officer Wang arrives, seeing Lin Mu. He exclaims that he's finally here and questions about the old head officer's condition. The officer replies that he's still unconscious, and it doesn't look good. Officer Wang expresses concern, stating that this man is essential to Huazia, and if he passes away, Huazia will plunge into civil unrest. Lin Mu reassures them, saying not to worry, as he'll do his best. He asks them to wait outside, and they all go outside. Officer Wang states that he'll leave the old head officer in Lin Mu's hands. Another officer questions whether it's really all right to hand the old head officer to that young man. Officer Wang responds that it's fine, he saved his daughter, and he trusts him. 
Meanwhile, Lin Mu considers using his Kai to check the old head's condition. He examines the old head's pulse and thinks about injecting Kai into his nerves, circulating it around his body. Finding it strange, Lin Mu observes that all his organs are in good condition, and they don't seem to belong to a dying person. He wonders if he missed something, decides to try again, and uses more Kai this time while checking the pulse once more. Closing his eyes, he thinks slowly and carefully about what went wrong. Lin Mu realizes that the issue lies in the heart. A small lump of vile Kai is trapped in the right ventricle, and it appears to have been there for a long time. He explains that this condition has caused the body to be deprived of oxygen for an extended period, triggering the failure of other organs. Lin Mu confidently states that it will be easy to fix, and he plans to use his Kai to eliminate the vile Kai. One of the officers standing outside wonders if the old head officer will be able to pull through this. Lin Mu comes out and reassures them, saying that older people should be fine and that he'll be waking up soon. The officers become happy and express relief, saying that's great. Officer Wang asks how Lin Mu cured him so quickly and inquires about the remaining time for the old head officer. Lin Mu responds, stating that he has removed the cause of the illness, but the organs have already started to fail. Unless a miracle happens, the old head officer will only be able to last for another six months. Three days later, the scene shifts to the Eastern Sea Military Zone. Commander Duan Fu Sheng shouts in frustration that it's ridiculous he has yet to die, and despite this, the group has decided to take action. He declares that as long as he's still alive, no one will be able to touch the Eastern Sea. Officer Wang urges him to calm down, reminding him that he has just recovered. Duan Fu Sheng expresses his lament, saying if only he could live for a few more years, what a pity. Officer Wang reassures him not to worry, mentioning that once they get over this hurdle. Duan Fu Sheng dismisses the attempt to console him, stating that he knows his own condition. He thought he wouldn't be able to survive this time, but he was saved, and it was a young man who did it. He asks if the young man is visiting him today, and if a car has been sent to pick him up. Officer Wang assures him not to worry, stating that he has made all the arrangements and that the young man will be arriving soon. An officer announces from outside that the guest has arrived. Officer Wang gets up, goes to the door, and brings Lin Mu inside. He introduces Lin Mu as the young man who saved Commander Duan Fu Sheng. Lin Mu greets Duan Fu Sheng and introduces himself, saying that his name is Lin Mu. Duan Fu Sheng invites him to have a seat, and Lin Mu thanks him before sitting in front of him. Duan Fu Sheng mentions that he's not part of the military, so Lin Mu can call him Grandpa Duan. Lin Mu agrees, and Grandpa Duan expresses gratitude, saying that thanks to Lin Mu, he's still able to sit and talk. Lin Mu replies, Grandpa Duan, enough with the thanks, it was just a simple thing to him. Besides, he's not fully cured, so he can't take all the credit. Grandpa Duan insists that Lin Mu is too modest, emphasizing that he saved his life, which is a great thing. He shares his perspective on reaching an older age and learning to let go of things that are not meant for him. Death is no longer scary to him. Officer Wang expresses admiration for Grandpa Duan's ability to accept things that cannot be controlled and the importance of letting go. He then informs them that the food is ready and suggests continuing their conversation over a meal. Grandpa Duan agrees and mentions that he's in a good mood, suggesting they have some drinks as well. Lin Mu, concerned about Grandpa Duan's health, says that he has just recovered and advises against drinking. After three hours, Grandpa Duan agrees to conclude their meeting, suggesting they meet again next time. The scene shifts to Sidhu Zai's house, where a lady informs Miss Sidhu about new developments regarding the matter she was instructed to keep an eye on. Miss Sidhu responds with enthusiasm, saying great, tell her about it. The lady reports that Lin Mu went to the military zone and stayed there for three hours. He was picked up and dropped off by the military. Sidhu Zhu asks if he stayed there for so long and wonders if they know what he was doing. The lady replies that they don't have any information. Situ Zhu questions why she is still there if there is no information and urges her to hurry up and find out. 
the lady bows down, saying they'll work on it right away, and then leaves. Situ Ziyu reflects on Lin Mu, wondering where he came from and why he is connected to the military as well. The next day, the scene shifts to Eastern Sea College, where Yan Lang she stands at the gate with flowers. Onlookers notice him, and a student asks who he is and why he is standing in front of the school so early in the morning. Another student replies that they don't know, but they heard he's here to look for the new school beauty. A different student questions where the new school beauty is, and another one remarks that something interesting seems about to happen. They spot a Lamborghini and exclaim if it isn't the latest model of Lamborghini. Situ Ziyu emerges from the car, and they exclaim, look, she's here. Observing the crowd, Situ Ziyu asks why so many people are standing around the school entrance today. Yan Lang, she approaches her and says finally, she's here, presenting her with the flowers. She becomes shocked and asks Yan Lang, she what he is doing there. He replies that he'll be wherever she is and presents her with a bouquet of blue roses, expressing the hope that she likes it. She takes the bouquet and thanks him. Yan Lang, she asks why she came to the Eastern Sea on her own without informing him. Meanwhile, she responds that she's there to accompany her father. He asks if that's so, but he doesn't think so. She questions what he is trying to say. He replies that he thinks it's because of that man. She notices Lin Mu and says that's Lin Mu. Yan Lang, she confirms, saying that's right, it's Lin Mu and mentions the words he whispered into her ears during the birthday party. He speculates that it touched her, and he's curious about what he said. She firmly replies that it's her personal matter, and he has no right to know or ask. He argues that she's his fiancé, so why can't he ask? She laughs and says that even if they're married, she won't need to report anything to him. He questions if that means she's interested in that guy called Lin Mu. She walks away, affirming that she's right, and tells him to stop harassing her. She doesn't want to make it ugly. He shouts, asking if she knows what she has just said. She confidently replies that of course she does, and he shouldn't think she's joking. Xing Wai Long informs Lin Mu that something is going on over there while looking at Sidu Ziyu and Yan Langshi. Lin Mu observes that a soft and gentle Kai emanates from a guy, and it's the first time he has seen a guy cultivate such soft and gentle internal energy. Xing Wai Long looks at him and asks why he is smiling. Lin Mu replies, saying there is nothing, and suggests they go. However, Xing Wai Long insists, saying Brother Lin hasn't finished watching the show. Yan Lang she thinks about how daring Lin Mu is to try to snatch his woman away from him. He reflects on the fact that there are only a handful of people in Huazia who dare to go against him, and Lin Mu is not one of them. On the same night, Lin Mu questions where they are going and why Xing Wai Long is acting so mysteriously. Xing Wai Long reassures him, saying not to worry, he'll find out soon enough. The guards open the gate and instruct them to go inside. Lin Mu comments that it's a charity gala dinner and asks if Xing Wai Long is interested in charity work. Xing Wai Long responds, Brother Lin, this is not his usual charity gala dinner. Don't worry, he'll find out soon enough. Lin Mu then inquires about what's going on with his ring. Xing Wai Long asks what's wrong, noticing Lin Mu looking pale. Lin Mu laughs it off, suggesting he might have a tummy ache and asks for the restroom. Xing Wai Long points to the restroom, telling him to wait there as he'll be back soon. Lin Mu mutters damn it and thinks about the ring trying to break free. He reflects on almost dying in the world of cultivation while trying to obtain this ring and realizes he mustn't lose it. Situ Ziyu calls out to Lin Mu, saying she can hear his voice inside, so he should come out. Lin Mu, surprised, asks who it is, realizing it's a woman's voice. He comes out and sees Miss Situ Ziyu, questioning why she is in the men's restroom. Meanwhile, she responds so there isn't anyone else around here anyway, so he's interested in charity work as well. He replies nope, it's not him. Xing Wai Long was the one who brought him here. She questions if something is going on. He replies that the guy from earlier, Yan Langxi, has misunderstood the relationship between the two of them, and he suspects he'll try to harm him soon. He asks if she's talking about the guy who confessed his love for her this morning in front of the school entrance. She dismisses the act, 
stating that he must have felt Yan Lang, she's murderous intent towards him. He confirms that he did feel it, but wonders what's next. She explains that if he faces Yan Lang she head on, he won't be his match, but Yan Lang she is known to ambush his opponents when they least expect it. She expresses her concern for him and grabs his collar. He says he didn't know she was worried about his safety and feels honored by it. She takes a deep breath and mentions that if it weren't for his help, she wouldn't have bothered warning him. He thanks her for the warning and assures her that he'll watch out for that guy. She says she has told him what she knows and wishes him good luck. A person with an earring comes and looks at them, thinking about their apparent hurry and wondering if they are doing something inside the men's restroom. Lin Mu and Xing Wai Long arrive at an auction where someone bids $10 million. The auction host announces they have a bid of $10 million, asking if anyone else will bid more. The host then locks in the bid at $10 million, expressing gratitude to Miss Lin for her contribution to charity. Lin Mu questions how a normal vase can fetch $10 million. Xing Wai Long explains that everyone present is filthy rich, and they are simply spending money in the name of charity. The auction host announces the next item, an ancient necklace with a mysterious age that no one has been able to determine. A scientist attempted to use the C-14 method to determine its age but failed. The scientist claimed that there is no known method in the world that can harm this necklace. Xing Wai Long questions if he believes those words about a necklace that can't be damaged. Lin Mu thinks that since the necklace appeared, the ring has been vibrating non-stop, pondering if the necklace could be somehow related to the ring as well. Mr. Kulz Liu bids $5 million for the necklace. Xing Wai Long questions if he believes it, and Lin Mu reassures him, saying someone else will call for it as well. Meanwhile, the auction host announces that Mr. Kuren Liu has bid $5 million and asks if anyone else is willing to make a higher bid. A lady bids $6 million, another person bids $10 million, and another lady bids $15 million. Mr. Liu then bids $20 million. The auction host states Mr. Liu has bid $20 million, and if is there any higher bid? Xing Wai Long expresses surprise, asking if he's serious about $20 million for a lousy necklace. Lin Mu laughs and comments that everyone here seems eager to do some charity. Mr. Ao Xiao Long unexpectedly bids $50 million, shocking everyone. They look at him, wondering how he could call for $50 million. The auction host announces Mr. Ao Xiao Long has bid $50 million and asks if there is anyone else. After some time, the host declares it a deal, thanking Mr. Pardao Xiao Long for his contribution to charity. Xing Wai Long identifies the bidder as Ao Xiao Long, prompting Lin Mu to inquire if he knows him. Xing Wai Long whispers that Ao Xiao Long is the current head of the Ao family, with connections in politics and the mafia. He emphasizes that Ao Xiao Long is not someone to be trifled with. Given that the Ao family also desires this necklace, it suggests there is something special about it, although it doesn't appear so. Lin Mu reflects on rumors stating that there are six other artifacts in the cultivation world similar to the ring he possesses. When these seven artifacts are combined, they create a complete set of outfits, granting invincibility to whoever wears them. He speculates that this necklace is likely one of the rumored artifacts but doesn't anticipate it appearing in this world with such weak spiritual energies. The scene shifts to the charity gala dinner vip room where the young master calls Lin Mu. He questions how Lin Mu dares to try to snatch Zur from him, emphasizing that now he has no choice but to make Lin Mu disappear. On the other side, Lin Mu sits and wonders why there is a cold shiver running down his spine. Just then, Green Snake approaches the young master and asks for his orders. The young master expresses his strong desire never to see Lin Mu dressed in white again. Green Snake assures him that he understands and promises that Lin Mu won't live to see tomorrow. The young master cautions Green Snake not to underestimate Lin Mu's skills and insists on a clean job. Green Snake assures him that he will never disappoint. Meanwhile, the man standing on the dais announces the conclusion of the charity gala dinner and expresses gratitude to everyone for supporting their charity work. 
Lin Mu asks Xing Wai Long why he brought him here and mentions that they have spent the whole night sitting there. Xing Wai Long responds by telling him to look around, stating that not everyone has the chance to attend such an event. He explains that he wanted to buy something and was hoping Lin Mu could give him some advice. Lin Mu questions why Xing Wai Long didn't bid for it himself. Xing Wai Long explains that he only brought $5 million, thinking it would be enough to buy something. However, he didn't even get a chance to bid because there are too many rich individuals in the Eastern Sea, and they are excessively wealthy, especially someone named Ao Xiao Long. He comments on Ao Xiao Long spending $50 million on a necklace, expressing his opinion that it's too much money for a piece of jewelry. Lin Mu suggests that maybe Ao Xiao Long is buying it for someone. Xing Wai Long questions if Lin Mu is serious and wonders if there is a need to spend that much money on someone else. Lin Mu informs Xing Wai Long that he has something urgent to attend to and decides to leave. Xing Wai Long asks about the rush, suggesting they could have dinner. Lin Mu moves to leave and insists that it's something very important and he can treat him to dinner on another day. After a while, at the underground car park, Lin Mu hides behind a pillar and thinks it's here. Near a blue car, a guard instructs Mr. Ao Xiao to please get in. Lin Mu observes him and expresses gratitude in his thoughts for helping him buy the necklace. He watches the car leave the parking area, thinking he has caught up. Lin Mu starts following them, contemplating where Mr. Tatia's Ao Xiao will hide the necklace so that he can steal it in the future. He considers the numerous traffic lights in the city, making it easy to follow a car by simply walking. Suddenly, masked robbers appear behind him and Lin Mu senses a murderous intent. He reflects that they don't look like normal robbers and asks, who is it? The masked individuals move to attack him and Lin Mu remarks, so naive. Suddenly, three darts also come towards him. Lin Mu questions if there are another three darts hiding in the shadows. A masked robber responds, right on target. Lin Mu states that those guys almost got to him. The masked robber believes he managed to dodge it and wonders how he did it. Suddenly, a robber approaches him from behind. Lin Mu grabs his hand and asks if the guy only knows how to attack from the back. He hits him, knocking him out. The other robber also moves to attack him, but he quickly retaliates, saying, too slow. The third robber looks at him and wonders how he managed to take down two of them in a flash. Who is this guy? Lin Mu moves to attack him and says it's his turn. He hits him, but the robber swiftly moves back. Lin Mu wonders what's going on, he missed. The robber says luckily, he was fast. He moves to attack again, saying he is pretty skilled as well, but he won't miss it again. The robber disappears again. Lin Mu asks what's going on. The other robbers also get up, and he warns them to be careful. This guy is strong, but he has found a way to defeat him. They transform into black dust and move to attack him. Lin Mu asks what this is and states that he understands, that's how they did it. He explains that they use the air current around them to distract their opponent, causing the opponent to misjudge their location. He moves to go and declares that there's an opening. He thinks as he had expected, this technique would be more refined if he infused Kai into it, and these three guys are just novices. He looks at them and asks where they are aiming, pointing out that he is over here. A robber acknowledges that he is highly skilled in the shadow technique and inquires if he is one of the elites of the Blackthorns. Lin Mu thinks they are easily convinced that he is one of them. He affirms, saying, that's right and asks who sent these guys to kill him. A robber apologizes, stating there may be a misunderstanding, and requests him to follow them back for further investigation. Lin Mu says he can't leave with those guys now, as he has a more important mission to complete. They can return first. He explains that if he doesn't return with them now, he will face more trouble later on, mentioning that there are nine assassins sent to kill him, and the present group is just a part of them. Lin Mu reassures them, saying not to worry as they won't be his match, and he has his own way of proving his identity. The robber acknowledges this and says that in that case, they shall not disturb him. 
Meanwhile, Green Snake stands on top of the building, observing everything, and remarks that Lin Mu is strong and has managed to learn in such a short time. He decides that in that case, he needs to show Lin Mu what he is made of. Lin Mu quickly runs from there and thinks he has lost track of Ao Xiao Long's car. It seems he needs to make other arrangements. Suddenly, a dagger hits him, and he asks, what's this? Green Snake comes in front of him and says, looks like he still managed to sense it. Lin Mu acknowledges his strength and expresses surprise that someone powerful would resort to such a sneak attack. Green Snake reveals he is an assassin and will do anything to complete his mission. Lin Mu falls to the ground and reveals he has been observing Green Snake since the encounter with those guys earlier on. Green Snake acknowledges this, stating that due to his strength, he had no choice but to launch a sneak attack to ensure a swift kill. He adds that Lin Mu is the second person he has killed using such a method and that he should feel honored. Lin Mu asks if Green Snake can share his name, wanting to know the identity of his killer. He inquires if he won't even grant a dying person's request. As Green Snake moves to leave, he reveals his name as Green Snake and Lin Mu says he will remember it. He quickly moves and attacks Lin Mu from behind, landing a hit. Drawing his knife, he prepares for another strike. Lin Mu perceives it as a well-concealed attack, yet he manages to sense it and respond promptly. Green Snake contemplates the situation, finding it perplexing that Lin Mu feigned death. However, it is evident that he suffered an attack. Lin Mu retaliates, but Green Snake skillfully evades. Lin Mu speculates that Green Snake may have reached the spirit convergence stage and activated the Kai region in his core, but he remains determined not to be defeated, asserting that Green Snake will be the one meeting his demise. Green Snake asserts that he has sustained a serious injury but is still capable of launching ferocious attacks. Lin Mu strikes him, and he coughs up blood, stating that this is the end for him. Green Snake demands to know his identity. He replies Lin Mu, remember the name of the person who killed him. He collapses to the ground, expressing disbelief, mentioning that he coated his knife with poison. Lin Mu realizes that the poison on the knife has spread throughout Green Snake's organs. He questions if this is the end for him, and he falls onto the road, lamenting that it is so unfair. The scene shifts to Lin Mu lying on a bed in an unconscious state, saying, it's so painful. Dr. Zhu Si Yun stands nearby and sees a photo frame, remembering her teacher. The story goes back to 10 years ago when she cried near an older teacher, saying it's all Yuner's fault, she had gotten him into this state. He reassures her, saying it's a doctor's duty to save those who need it, and he has saved her life with no regrets. He encourages her to continue living on and help save more people. Returning to the present, she reveals that she was infected with a strange illness when her teacher adopted her. She has managed to live until this day because he used a secret technique to suppress his illness. She opens a cupboard and mentions that every time he used the secret technique, he would age rapidly, sacrificing his life to save her. Opening a box, she adds that to this day, she has barely mastered the secret technique, but as long as she is still a doctor, she will continue. She sits near Lin Mu with her needles and asserts that she won't let anything happen to him. She starts pushing the needles into his body and encourages him not to give up as well. She thinks the secret technique will take a huge toll on her body, and if this continues, she might die as well. She resolves to buck up, reminding herself that the teacher treated her like his own daughter. He even sacrificed his life to save her. Since she is determined to help save the world as a doctor, she must not give up now. She appeals to her old teacher, asking him to give her the strength to do this. She recalls that her old teacher said she must be precise and quick when using this technique. She recalls that he said she must not stay more than a second at each acupuncture point, or else all his efforts would be wasted. She thinks she must hang on, she can do it. She looks at Lin Mu's face and says the darkness on his face is fading, it's working. She recalls that the old teacher said to remember not to stop at all while she is placing the needle or else the patient would die. She thinks she won't let him die. She takes his finger and pushes it into the chest, saying an inch of radiance. 
she falls on him and says to the teacher that she has done it, and Lin Mu is saved. The scene shifts to Sidhu's house, where she is sleeping and receives a call. She asks who it is and says it's so early in the morning. Upon attending the call, she inquires of Song Yuru, what's up? Yuru informs her that Lin Mu has been missing for three days. Situ acknowledges and assures Yuru to wait for her updates. She emphasizes that she still needs his help to advance to other cultivation levels, urging him not to succumb. She tells him to give her some time to think. Shortly after, she receives a call from Yan Lang Shi and, upon answering, asks if he has any connection to Lin Mu's disappearance. Three days ago, the scene shifts to Dr. P Chu lying on a bed, regaining consciousness. She asks where she is and questions if this is heaven. Getting up, she asserts that this is her place and that it seems she is still alive. Driven to find Lin Mu, she inquires about his whereabouts and wonders where he went. Spotting him in meditation, she remarks that he appears to be all right now. He asks if she is awake, to which she responds that she didn't expect him to recover so quickly, but is glad he is better. He inquires if she is all right. She responds that she is fine. Seating her on a chair, he reassures her not to worry, stating that his body is fine now. He expresses gratitude, thanking her for saving his life and promising to repay this debt one day. She asserts that saving the ill is a doctor's duty and clarifies that she didn't do it expecting repayment. He then asks how she removed the poison from his body, expressing his belief that he was doomed. She explains that she utilized her teacher's secret technique, the golden needle technique, to save him. She mentions that he has used these 27 needles to save numerous people and was bestowed the title of divine doctor. She mentions that she has yet to master this technique, it was challenging for him to use, and she almost failed. He observes that she looks pale and asks if she is alright. She assures him that she is fine, explaining that she has a weak constitution and used too much energy the previous night while attempting to remove the poison. He asks if her teacher did not try to cure her weak constitution. She replies that her teacher did everything he could to save her, emphasizing that she wouldn't be alive today if it were not for him. She reveals that he expended too much energy trying to save her and passed away ten years ago. He thinks she has barely mastered the technique, but was able to remove the lethal poison from his body. He wonders what illness she is suffering from that even her teacher could not cure. She mentions feeling a little dizzy and then falls unconscious on the table. He thinks it looks like she has used up too much energy trying to save him and almost lost her life in the process. He escorts her back to the room and places her on the bed. Observing a table, he comments that this area appears clean. It seems she frequently cleans this table. Noticing a peculiar brick, he inquires about it. Removing some bricks, he concludes that one particular brick seems loose, it appears someone has loosened it. Upon further examination behind the brick, he notes that someone hid something there. Discovering a letter, he realizes it is a missive left behind by her teacher. In the letter, he writes that his real name is Mu Ren Kin, and he has been mastering his family's secret technique, the Golden Needle Technique. It is named after the golden needles they use to restore vitality to those they save, known to others as an inch of radiance. He explains that if one masters this technique to its highest level, they can revive the dead, as the legends say. Unfortunately, a long time ago, a part of the technique manual, specifically the portion on internal energy control, was lost. He states that without strong cultivation, one cannot fully unleash the potential of the golden needle technique, and if one persists in utilizing the technique without heeding this advice, premature death will inevitably ensue. During his younger days, he journeyed across the world to aid the sick and needy. However, he incurred the wrath of a mysterious organization which has been attempting to pilfer his family's technique ever since. Forced to conceal it in the Eastern Sea, he sustained severe injuries from them, causing his skills to deteriorate. Ultimately, he could only seal up her meridians to grant her another ten years of life. He mentions discussing Dr. Karmeju's condition as well. In the letter, he conveys that if no one can assist her in suppressing her condition within 10 years, she will succumb to it. He 
His greatest life regret is being unable to cure Yuner. He leaves behind the Inch of Radiance manual for the Destined One, hoping they can use the technique to cure Yuner, allowing his spirit to find peace. He cautions in the letter that without a robust cultivation background, one should refrain from using this technique. It is not as facile as it may seem, and usage comes with inherent risks. Reflecting on it, he believes she employed this technique to save him. He resolves to ensure that Dr. Kamju sees the letter and can utilize the technique, provided she possesses a strong cultivation background. The scene shifts to nighttime as Dr. Kamju wakes up. Upon realizing that she is awake, he inquires about how she is feeling. Expressing an improved condition, she notices the letters on the table and inquires about them. He responds that she will understand after reading them. After perusing the contents, she expresses her indebtedness to the teacher, noting that he continues to think about her even in the face of impending death. She wonders where he found these letters. He explains that he found them between the walls while dusting the altar. She acknowledges this and laments that, unfortunately, the destined one mentioned in the letters did not appear in the end. He counters, stating that it's not true. Perhaps he is the fated one mentioned in the letters. She dismisses it as a joke, asserting that she knows he is a talented guy, but talent alone does not guarantee the ability to cultivate, and a strong cultivation foundation is essential to learn this technique, or the consequences could be fatal. He reassures her not to worry about this. Perplexed, she asks for clarification. He expresses his belief that she possesses some knowledge about cultivation and inquires if she thinks he is good enough to learn the technique. She questions if he can gather his kai at his fingertip, mentioning that even her teacher was unable to accomplish it. After a while, Lin Mu and Zhu walk on the road. She remarks on an unexpected discovery, suggesting that he might be able to learn an inch of radiance after all. He speculates that perhaps he doesn't need to fully master it before being able to cure her illness. She expresses hope in this possibility and pledges to be by his side to help expedite his learning. He reflects on the notion that as long as there is hope for continued living, no one will give up on life. Zhu Siyun, being a doctor, understands how precious life can be. She shares that she initially thought she would spend the rest of her dying days attempting to cure a few more patients. He emphasizes the principle that kindness begets good karma, mentioning that she risked her life to save him, and in turn, gained a chance to continue living. She agrees, affirming that saving others is akin to saving oneself. The story transitions to a flashback. Her teacher states that it's a doctor's duty to save the ill, emphasizing that when she saves others, she is actually saving herself. He imparts the idea that the world is round, and what goes around comes around. She assures him that she will remember his words. Returning to the present, Lin Mu expresses heartfelt gratitude for saving him and mentions the need to return home. His family is likely worried about his several days of absence. She acknowledges this and agrees, mentioning that she will return to her work at the hospital. She bids him goodbye for now. Half an hour later, Lin Mu walks on the road, contemplating the unbelievable existence of such a powerful technique in the world. He reflects that the creator of this technique must have a profound understanding of the human body, making them unparalleled in strength. As he approaches a crowd by the bridge, he inquires about what is happening over there. A car is being driven into the sea. A person remarks that the car owner is probably going to die. Another person states that the rescue team has not arrived yet, expressing doubt that the owner can hang on much longer. A girl comments on the owner of the sports car, likely a wealthy individual, expressing disbelief that such a person would die in such a place, considering it a twisted fate. Lin Mu inquires if someone has fallen into the waters. A brown-haired man informs Lin Mu that a young lady drove the car into the sea. He attempted to save her but couldn't break the windows. Another man asks Lin Mu if he is going down to save her. The brown-haired man discourages the idea, asserting that it's useless. They should wait for the rescue team since the windows are too tough to break. Lin Mu declares that he will give it a try, reasoning that if they wait for the rescue team, the owner will likely be dead by then. 
He jumps into the river, relieved that the water isn't too deep, and asks about the car's location. Spotting the car, he urges the person to hang on, assuring them that he will arrive shortly. Upon seeing Luo Bingyan in the car, he recognizes her and comments on the toughness of the glass, which is likely bulletproof. Determined, he gives a punch to the mirror, noting that bulletproof glass is no match for him. Extracting Luo Bingyan, he observes that she is breathless and decides to pass some Kai to her. Employing mouth-to-mouth -mouth breath, he encourages her to hang on, vowing not to let her die. The story shifts to a flashback. Luo Bingyan sits in the car, contemplating the purpose of living, for family glory, for business profits. Feeling overwhelmed, she starts driving into the water, not anticipating that it will lead to this moment. She finds it unfair and, spotting Lin Mu, wonders why she is thinking of him during her seemingly final moments in life. Returning to the present, Lin Mu lays her on the floor and opens her eyes. He reassures her, expressing relief that she is finally awake. Confused, she asks what happened to her and questions if they are in heaven. He informs her that she is not dead, he has saved her. Overwhelmed with emotion, she hugs him, cries and expresses how much she misses him. Lin Mu comforts her, assuring her that everything is fine now. Curious, she asks how he found her. Lin Mu explains that as he was passing by, he heard someone in the water, went down to save them, and unexpectedly found her. He inquires why she drove her car into the water, and she admits to suddenly losing control of the car. Concerned, he remarks that suddenly losing control is dangerous and urges her to follow him to get changed before she catches a cold. Onlookers praise him, acknowledging his amazing feat. After a while, at Eastern Sea College, Dr. Tamshu states that he is still fine when she sees him in the morning and asks why his phone is switched off. Just then, Ms. Song Yuru arrives with her girls, calls Zhu, and says the lady over there heard he is looking for Lin Mu. She confirms that's right and asks if they are his friends. Pff. Song asks why she is looking for Lin Mu and says he has not returned home for the past few days, they also do not know where he is. She explains that Lin Mu was staying at her place for the past few days, but he left this morning. She tried calling his phone, but he was not picking up, so she got worried. Xi Roman 11 asks if Lin Mu is staying at her place and inquires about what happened. She explains that Lin Mu was badly injured a few days ago, and she saved him, so he was staying at her place to recuperate. Xi Roman 11 asks if he was badly injured, and she affirms that he was. She explains that she heard an assassin by the name of Green Snake tried to kill him. Xi Roman 11 says she knew it, he would not have disappeared without a good reason, and as she had suspected, something bad had happened to him. Doctor interjects, asking why he hasn't returned to school yet and if something happened to him on the way alone. The scene shifts to the Yan family's house. A guard approaches Yan Zhang King and informs him that their men have returned with some news, Green Snake has failed to kill Lin Mu, and that young man has appeared again and returned home. Yan Zhang King expresses frustration, stating that it's ridiculous they have spent so much effort raising a capable helper and they have lost him in the Eastern Sea. The guard advises him to calm down, mentioning that the young man is inexperienced. Yan Zhang King retorts, saying that's easy for him to say, and asks why he does not take care of it on his own. The guard responds that he won't dare and suggests leaving it to the Bloodthorns to handle. Yan Zhang King instructs him to send the Bloodthorns, emphasizing not to underestimate Lin Mu. He adds that even though Green Snake has failed, Lin Mu is not a normal young man. Meanwhile, Lin Mu is at home when Amis, Song arrives with her girls and inquires about when he will return home. He apologizes, expressing regret for causing them to worry, and explains that something happened in the past few days. Xi Roman 11 asserts that he should have communicated when he reached home and asks if he knows how worried they were. The girl in the white dress concurs, stating that they were looking for him everywhere, only for him to sneak back home without informing them. Song intervenes, suggesting that both of them should stop reprimanding him and instead be glad that he is fine now. 
Lin Mu inquires how they knew he was hurt, and she reveals that Sister Zhu informed them that she had been looking for him in school that day. He asks if she means Dr. Ta Zhu and questions why she is looking for him in school. Zai Roman 11 explains that Dr. Bam Zhu mentioned trying to call his phone, but it was off, leading to concerns that something might have happened to him on the way home. Lin Mu then asks about the relationship between the two of them. He clarifies that it's not what she is thinking and explains that Dr. Kiva Zhu is his benefactor. She was the one who saved him when he fell off the building. It's also thanks to her that he survived the attack from the assassin, otherwise she would not have been able to see him anymore. She inquires if that is so and asks if he is sure nothing happened between the two of them. He asserts that he is not that kind of guy and urges her to stop the chit-chat because he got a call. He attends Dr. Ju's call and apologizes, mentioning that his phone had fallen into the water and was at the repair shop. Zai Roman 11 remarks that it's a call from Sister Zhu and asks if he would marry her to repay her for saving his life. The girl in the white dress adds that it's hard to say, considering she's a beautiful girl and saved him twice. He overhears some men teasing Dr. Siat Zhu and she asks what they are doing. Lin Mu inquires about what happened, and he explains that if he doesn't want anything to happen to her, he should come to the third floor of Yin Huang Kaoj immediately, where his boss is waiting for them. Lin Mu questions who these guys are. Z Song asks for details and wonders if it was Dr. Chu Zhu's voice on the phone. He reveals that Dr. Fu Fit has been kidnapped and he needs to save her. Xi Roman 11 advises against it, deeming it too dangerous and questioning whether it might be a trap. The girl in the white dress agrees, suggesting that they call the police first. Lin Mu opposes calling the police, expressing concern that they might harm Dr. Daoju, and insists on meeting these people himself. Half an hour later, Lin Mu arrives at the third floor of Yin Huang Kaoj and acknowledges that this is the place. As he attempts to enter, the guard at the door questions his identity and whether he has an appointment. Lin Mu informs him that he is there to see his boss and requests entry. The guard challenges him, questioning who he is and implying that meeting his boss is not an easy feat. Lin Mu twists the guard's hand, asserting that his boss wants to meet him, and if any harm befalls him for trying to obstruct, consequences will follow from the boss. The guard, expressing pain, proceeds to lead Lin Mu to the boss while wondering about the identity of this visitor. He notifies the boss that someone is here to see him. A bald man sits and asks if he is Lin Mu. Upon seeing Dr. Kem Deju tied to a chair, Lin Mu realizes that she is indeed present. He urges the boss to release her, emphasizing that they are respectable members of society and questioning how he could exploit a woman to achieve his goals. He expresses disappointment, thinking it's going to be someone strong and powerful, but it turns out to be just a young boy, making it seem like easy money. Lin Mu observes as many guys approach him, stating that he doesn't want to waste his time and inviting all of them to come at him together. They proceed to attack, mocking him for his arrogance and vowing to show him what they're made of. Lin Mu swiftly knocks them all out. A black-haired man is shocked and asks what he did. The bald man instructs the others to go after him together. Lin Mu dismisses them as a bunch of useless fools. They warn him not to get cocky, pointing out that there are many of them and only one of him. They move to attack and surround him, but he quickly disappears. They are shocked and ask if he missed him. Lin Mu stands aside and inquires about what they are looking for, stating that he is here. Doctor, Chu thinks Lin Mu is a master in cultivation, noting that this bunch of hooligans will not be his match at all. He hits and knocks them out, remarking that they are weak. Lin Mu then unties Dr. Tamu's song and apologizes for keeping her waiting, expressing hope that she is fine. The bald man questions how he could defeat all his men in such a short time. Lin Mu responds that they are just too weak and wonders if he would be slightly stronger than them. He points the gun and suggests that just because he knows Kung Fu, he thinks he is invincible, expressing disbelief that he will be faster than a bullet. Lin Mu asserts that he is definitely not faster than a bullet, but he just needs to be faster than him. He states that he can die now. 
Lin Mu swiftly moves and points the gun towards his leg shooting. His leg is injured, and he screams, asking who the hell he is. Lin Mu reveals that he is the one who asked him to come here, but he does not know who he is. He pleads for mercy, asking to be let go and promising to repay his debt in the future. Lin Mu responds that he does not need him to repay him. He points his finger at his head, saying he wants him to pay for it now. The bald man forgets everything and asks who he is and where he is. Doctor. Song questions what he did to him. Lin Mu explains that he just used an inch of radiance to wake his brain. He notices many men coming there and remarks on what a crowd it is. Shen Zhu Guang comments that it is pretty amazing to be able to defeat so many people in such a short time. Lin Mu asks who he is, and he introduces himself as Shen Zhu Guang. He mentions that this place belongs to his friend, and he has caused trouble for her, making the situation difficult. Lin Mu recognizes that he is Wang Roman Eleven King's superior, the city police commissioner. He informs both of them that they are now under arrest for causing grievous harm to others and requests them to follow him to the police station. Lin Mu asserts that he was the one who beat up the men there, and it has nothing to do with the lady. He suggests arresting him and letting her go. Dr. Pao Zhu attempts to say something, but Lin Mu assures her not to worry, stating that he will be fine. Shen Zhu Guang questions when he ever needs others to tell him what to do and instructs the officers to arrest everyone there. Dr. Pao Zhu tells him to forget it. An officer instructs them to please follow. Lin Mu apologizes to Dr. Pao Zhu for dragging her into this. She asks what he is talking about and expresses gratitude for coming to his rescue. Just then, Xing Wai Long arrives and questions what's with a big commotion, mentioning that they didn't even let him in. He sees Lin Mu and asks what he is doing here. He questions the men about who they are and where they are taking Brother Lin. A man with a red shirt explains that they are police at work, and these two guys have caused trouble here, advising him to mind his own business. Lin Mu hands him a piece of paper and mentions that it's great timing, asking him to hold onto this piece of paper. Xing Wai Long inquires about what it is. Lin Mu moves with them and instructs him to call the number on the paper, informing the person on the other line about what had happened to him and thanking him for his help. The story shifts to the Eastern Sea City Police Station, where an officer informs Dr. Ken Zhu that a guy called Lin Mu has confessed to everything and she can leave now. She contends that they were the ones who started it first. The officer insists that they will investigate the incident. She then inquires about Lin Mu's whereabouts and what will happen to him. Meanwhile, at the detention center, Lin Mu suggests letting them teach him a lesson and invites them to punch him. As he falls to the ground, he states that he is going to rest now and advises them not to disturb his rest if they are smart. Another man approaches and asks what they are waiting for, instructing them to go get him. He moves to attack, expressing that Lin Mu is way too cocky. Lin Mu responds that since he wants to beat him up, he will let him have a punch. He moves to attack them, cautioning them not to regret it. As he moves his head forward, the opposite punch hits his head, and he screams with pain in his hand. Huang sees him and thinks this kid is not as simple as he looks. He's clearly well-trained. He moves to attack Lin Mu and says let him test him. Lin Mu stops his attack, holds his hands, and says an attack to the chest and stomach at the same time. It looks like he knows Kung Fu as well, but he is no match for him, and he throws Huang away. He observes that his internal energy is strong. A yellow man asks how this is possible, and bro Huang is the strongest among them. He loses to him in one move. Meanwhile, Shen Zhu Guang receives a call from Commissioner Li, who asks who gave him the right to arrest Lin Mu. He explains that Lin Mu was caught beating up others, and he is only following the procedures. Commissioner Li instructs him to stop acting in front of him, asserting that Lin Mu is not someone they can touch, and he should release him immediately. He adds that if he releases Lin Mu, the Yan family. Commissioner Li wonders why he would bother with this young man, suspecting that the Yan family is behind this. He warns him that if anything happens to Lin Mu, even the Yan family won't be able to save him. He attempts to say something, but Commissioner Li cuts the call. 
He reflects on the fact that Commissioner Lee from the police headquarters actually called him to ask for the release of Lin Mu. He wonders about this guy's identity and instructs Zio Liu to follow him to the detention center. As he follows him, he asks what happened. He advises not to ask any questions, stating that the Yan family has gotten him into deep trouble. The scene shifts to Yan's family house, and a guard informs Yan Zhong King that he has checked as per his instructions. He reports that Shen Zhu Guang received a call from the head commissioner, Li Yao Rong, and released Lin Mu at his orders. Yan Zhong King asks why Li Yao Rong would know a guy called Lin Mu. The guard responds that Li Yao Rong does not know Lin Mu at all, and he receives another call before calling Shen Zhu Guang with the release order. Yan Zhang King questions if someone is able to order Li Yao Rong, who is in the back trying to protect Lin Mu. The guard apologizes, stating that they were unable to find out that information and their conversation was encrypted. If they tried to break the encryption, they might raise suspicions. Yan Zhang King declares that since they have offended this brat, they can't stop now, he must die. He instructs him to contact Blackthorns and asks them to assign overseas assassins to kill him. He emphasizes that this time they can't let him escape again. The guard assures him that there is no problem and that he will contact them right away. Meanwhile, at the Eastern Sea City Police Station in the detention center, Shen Zhu Guang releases Lin Mu and explains that it's all a misunderstanding, hoping he won't take it to heart. Lin Mu inquires if he may leave now, and Shen Zhu Guang affirms, saying of course. Xing Wai Long arrives and expresses relief that he is finally out. He mentions hearing that Lin Mu is all right and comes to fetch him. Lin Mu begins to walk with him, and Xing Wai Long suggests celebrating his release with a treat at Hilton, telling him to order anything he likes. Lin Mu remarks on his generosity that day and questions if he is plotting something. Xing Wai Long insists, of course not, it's just a simple treat for Bro Lin. The scene shifts to half an hour later at the Hilton Hotel. He informs Lin Mu that they have reached. A waiter directs them to their table and he suggests Lin take a look at the menu and order anything he likes. Lin Mu mentions that he's not good at ordering food, but he proceeds to do so. He assures him not to hold back, and he orders foie gras with caviar, crab in curry sauce, and steamed lobster. After ordering, Lin Mu stands up and asks the waiter if she knows where the restroom is. She offers to bring him there, and he thanks her and starts to follow her. She informs him that the restroom is ahead on the left side, to which he responds, all right? Meanwhile, in another dining room of the hotel, Mr. Kung's Wang informs Miss Yao Kian that they have invited her here tonight to discuss the leading role for his new movie and asks if she has read the script. She confirms that she has indeed read the script and is pleased with it. Furthermore, she does not have any issues with the contract. However, she inquires about the identity of the leading actor in this movie. He responds that they have not yet decided on the actor for the leading role and asks if she has any recommendations. Miss Yao Kian suggests that, based on the script's content, it would be best to find a newcomer for the leading role. She mentions that she has someone in mind who would be perfect for the role, but she is uncertain about his interest. The director, Feng Yu Fan, then asks about this individual. She explains that she encountered him at her concert, where she attempted to invite him on stage to sing with her. Unfortunately, he declined, causing an embarrassing moment. An hour later, Xing Wai Long and Lin Mu walk out after having a meal. Lin Mu expresses satisfaction with the food, to which Xing Wai Long responds that he's glad he enjoyed it and suggests they visit this place often in the future. Ms. Yao notices him and asks what he is doing there. Xing Wai Long looks at her, contemplating the situation, and if this is not the famous megastar Yao Kian, he doesn't expect her to know Lin as well. She informs Feng Yu Fan that Lin Mu is the guy he is talking about and asks for his opinion. Feng Yu Fan comments that Lin Mu is not bad, expressing approval for his good taste, good looks and poise, considering him perfect for the leading character in his movie. Mr. D. Wang asks Lin Mu if they can have a chat assuring him that it won't take up too much of his time. Xing Wai Long suggests they have plenty of time today and can talk anywhere. 
He advises Lin Mu that these individuals are significant figures in the entertainment industry, and there's no harm in talking to them. Lin Mu agrees, saying it is all right. They all move, and a waiter shows them the way. Miss Yao introduces Lin Mu to a famous investor in Huazia, Mr. Paul's Wang. They exchange greetings. She further introduces the scriptwriter, Wang Shu Yu, producer Wang Zhang, and director Feng Yu Fan. He greets them all. Ms. Yao gets straight to the point, stating that they would like to discuss something with him. Lin Mu encourages her to continue. She informs him that Mr. Pao Wang is preparing to film a new movie, and she intends to recommend him as the leading actor for it. Xing Wai Long expresses surprise, questioning if he heard correctly that she wants Lin Mu to star in a movie. Feng Yu Fan confirms, stating that Yao Kian feels he's perfect for the role in terms of his looks and poise, as if the role were tailor-made for him. Lin Mu expresses hesitation, mentioning that he doesn't know how to act and that his major is history. Feng Yu Fan responds, stating that life is like a show, and it's all about how he acts in life. He asserts that acting is simply an expression of life, mentioning that Miss Yao will also be acting in this movie with him and he is confident that this movie will be a big hit. Lin Mu expresses doubt, stating that it might not be right, and that he messes up, causing a waste of everyone's time and effort. Miss Yao pleads with him, asking for a favor. She genuinely can't think of anyone else besides him for this role. She reassures him not to worry, as both the director and she will assist him, and the other actors will also lend their support. Xing Wai Long encourages Lin Mu to give it a try, emphasizing that there is a first time for everything, and who knows, he may discover his talent in acting. Miss Yao agrees, stating that he is correct, and that many stars didn't graduate from acting school. Instead, they stumbled upon the entertainment industry by fate and became world famous. Lin Mu concedes, stating that since all of them are encouraging him, he will give it a try. However, he issues a warning, stating that if anything goes wrong, they shouldn't blame him. Feng Yufan assures him that it's a deal, expressing confidence that he won't encounter any issues with the movie directed by him. Mr. Komas Wang inquires about Lin Mu's availability for the next day and suggests signing the contract at that time. Lin Mu agrees and asks for a specific time. Mr. Wang hands him a card and states that tomorrow, around 10 a.m., he should come to the provided address. Lin Mu acknowledges, thanking him for his confidence and assuring them that he will be there tomorrow. The following day, Mr. Kodo Wang instructs Lin Mu to take a look at the contract and if everything is in order to sign it. Lin Mu reviews and signs the contract, expressing no issues with its terms and deeming them reasonable. Mr. Pin Wang acknowledges his acceptance, hoping for a productive collaboration, and Lin Mu thanks him for the opportunity. Yao Zian Zian approaches and informs Lin Mu about a fitting scheduled for later, asking if it's all right with him. Lin Mu agrees, stating that he will follow her arrangement. The brown-haired man signals the start, and the crew members ensure the lights and cameras are positioned. Feng Yu Fan hands Lin Mu the script, instructing him to understand the character's thoughts and feelings when acting out the scene. Although Lin Mu has no prior acting experience, he believes that expressing the character's emotions will be easy for him given his experiences in the cultivation world. Feng Yu Fan informs him they will begin when he's ready. Yao Zian Zian reassures him not to be nervous, expressing confidence that this won't be a problem for him. Meanwhile, at Lin Mu's place, Ms. Song Yuru mentions that Wang Shao Kun is a renowned movie investor in Huazia, and all the movies he invests in become blockbusters. She predicts that Lin Mu is going to become famous. The girl in the white dress wonders how Wang Shao Kun discovered Lin Mu, considering he is not from the school of acting and lacks experience in the field. She raises the possibility of a conspiracy, but Ms. Song Yuru dismisses it stating that Lin Mu was recommended by Yao Zian Zian, a megastar who wouldn't go to such lengths to harm a college student. Zai Roman 11 questions why Lin Mu was chosen among the many handsome actors in the entertainment industry and suggests there might be something going on between Lin Mu and Yao Zian Zian. She reminds the others that Lin Mu went missing for a few days, further fueling suspicion. 
The girl in the white dress defends Yao Zion Zion, stating that Zai Roman 11 is a big fan of hers and that she shouldn't suspect her idol. However, Zai Roman 11 remains skeptical, expressing that if Lin Mu dares to betray them, she'll give him a beating. The scene shifts after half an hour at the studio, where Lin Mu performs an acting scene, kneeling and pleading not to be left. Fong Yu Fan and Yao Zion Zion observe his performance. After finishing, Lin Mu stands up and asks for feedback. The brown-haired man praises him, calling him a genius and stating it was a perfect performance. Lin Mu turns to Fong Yu Fan and inquires if he believes others can act alongside him. Yao Zian Zian responds that Lin Mu is a natural-born actor and his skills are so impeccable that no one will have trouble acting alongside him. That night, Yao Zian Zian and Lin Mu walked on the road while she said it was just a meal, not to be shy with her. They reached a restaurant where they had dinner, and she asked him if his performance that morning had stunned her and what his secret was. He replied she was being too kind with her words and he didn't have any secret to acting. He had just been through a lot in life. She replied she didn't think it was just personal experiences and said he could cut the act. He was a highly skilled martial arts master as well. She asked if she was right, and he asked how she knew. She replied that her family was also influential. It wasn't hard to find out about something. She said his name was well known right now, and the incident at the city police headquarters had attracted the attention of all the big families in the city. He replied he was overwhelmed by the flattery and thought he had just gotten Zing Wai Long to call up the Bao Long group. He didn't expect their influence to be this wide. They got him out in an hour. Meanwhile, she remarked that all the big families were in a mess now. They were all guessing who was backing him while eating food. He smiled and said they had an overactive imagination. He was just a student and didn't have any forces backing him. She said if he didn't have enough power, how could he get Li Yao Rong to let him go personally? He asked who Li Yao Rong was. She became shocked and asked if he didn't know who Li Yao Rong was. He replied what's wrong, he's supposed to know him. She said it looked like he was deep. A person with such a high status as Li Yao Rong personally called to let him off, and he didn't even know him. He replied it sounded like Li Yao Rong was not a simple person. She responded of course not. Li Yao Rong is the highest ranking commissioner of the police force in the capital. He's in charge of the nation's security but may have someone strong backing him. Still, someone is keen to get rid of him. He replied that it sounded like the Yao family had heard something. She said that was correct. According to the information he had, he was almost killed by the secret group raised by the Yan family and the guy called Green Snake. He should know how strong he is. He said so. He's really from the Yan family. No wonder Situ Ziu warned him about Yan Langshi. She smiled and said that the Yan family had gotten an even stronger assassin from Blackthorn to come after him after the last failed assassination. He heard the assassin is from Europe and will arrive within two days. He asked how the Zhao family found out about such confidential information. She said not to tell her, she wouldn't tell him. He might have someone strong backing him, but she still hoped he would be careful. He asked why she was reminding him, and she said because he's the leading actor in the movie and who would she find to act with her if he's dead. He thought it wasn't as simple as she claimed. He bet the Yao family was keen to discover the forces standing behind him, but they differed from the Yan family. He guessed they wanted to get him on their side. The scene shifts to the next day at Ying Huang KOG, where Lin Mu thinks that since the next assassin is coming, he needs to be ready for it, but he can't find anyone to do it. A guard at the gate apologizes, saying that this place is closed for a private event and they're not open to the public. Lin Mu thinks it's even better if it's not open, there won't be many people around. The guard shouts if he's deaf and asks if he's going to walk away on his own or if he wants them to get the ambulance for him. Wu Chan Ming comes inside and says it's young master Lin Mu. He apologizes for the confusion, mentioning that these men are not too bright. In charge of security, Wu Chan Ming asks Lin Mu to follow him. One of the guards calls him Brother Ming. Wu Chan Ming replies, asking how dare they stop young master Lin Mu and telling them to hurry up and apologize. 
Both guards apologize, stating they must have been blinded to stop him. Lin Mu says it's fine, they're just doing their job. Wu Qianming asks Lin Mu why he is free to come over here today. One of the guards asks who the hell young Master Lin is, while the other guard says he's not sure and has never seen him before. However, it looks like he's not someone they want to trifle with. Meanwhile, Wu Qianming says it's such bad timing as a few brothers are negotiating the reallocation of territories. Lin Mu replies that it's even better. They can discuss it together. Wu Qianming says they are in there and it's not convenient for him to go in. Lin Mu knocks on the door and says he gets it, he'll go in by himself. He says excuse him, sorry for the inconvenience and mentions that he's here today to discuss something with everyone. A bald person gets angry and asks who he is and if he doesn't know the rules. He says someone gets this brat out of here. Brother Jai recognizes him and says he's young master Lin Mu, asking why he is here. The bald person asks who this guy is. Commissioner Shen says to remember this, never ever seek trouble with Lin Mu, or it's the end for him. Brother Jai replies that he got it and whispers that he's Lin Mu. Even Commissioner Shen doesn't dare to mess with him. The gray-haired man says Lin Mu's words are important, even to Commissioner Shen, while the bald person replies pardon his rudeness, please have a seat. Lin Mu says sure, and everyone looks at him. After a while, Lin Mu says all right, no need to look around, he knows what they are thinking. A person with a face cut interjects no, young master Lin Mu, he must be mistaken. They're tired from playing mahjong last night and his eyes keep twitching. Lin Mu replies don't worry, he's not here to snatch territories from them guys. He's just here today to ask for a small favor. Brother Jai asks what it is, just say it and they'll do it. There's no need for him to come down personally. Lin Mu responded, it was not convenient to talk about it over the phone. It's much easier to discuss it in person. Lin Mu informs them that a European professional assassin will soon appear in Eastern Sea City and he needs their help to find him. A person with a cut on his face asks if this person has any distinctive features. Lin Mu replies that he's not sure, he only knows he is a European and will enter the city over the next few days. Therefore, they need to keep an eye out for all foreigners entering the country recently. A person in a black suit says, this seems to be rather difficult. Brother Jai comments that so many foreigners are entering the Eastern Sea every day, and if they don't know what he looks like, it's like finding a needle in a haystack. The bald person adds that tracking an assassin is very dangerous and lives could be lost. Lin Mu says he understands their worries, which is why the higher the danger, the greater the reward. He opens a box and says that they can get this pill as long as they can help him find the assassin. Brother Jai asks what the pill is. Lin Mu replies, if anyone here have the guts to help him display the strength of this pill. Wu Tianming gets up and says he'll do it, coming closer to Lin Mu and asking how he wants to do it, just go ahead and tell him. Meanwhile, he instructs Wu Tianming to remove his clothes and show his back to everyone. Wu Tianming agrees and removes his clothes, revealing his back to all. Lin Mu says that's very good. Now he doesn't move, and he thinks it looks like he's a retired soldier, he should be able to handle his attack. He announces that he will attack, and they should bear with it. Wu Tianming replies, young master, bring it on, and Lin Mu gives a cut on his back, causing everyone to become shocked. They get up from their seats, and another person asks what he is doing, while the bald person asks how he did it. Lin Mu replies, stop talking, and take a good look at it. He says to everyone that he'll take a small portion of the pill to show them, emphasizing that it's just a tiny bit and the wound will heal immediately. He throws the powder of the pill on Wu Tianming's wound and it starts healing. Brother Jai asks if he is seeing things as the wound is healing right before them. Lin Mu declares that everyone has seen the effect and as long as they still have a breath left, this pill will be able to save their lives. He asks the man, whose name is Wu Tianming, to confirm. Then he says not bad, he's a real man, he can have this pill, and he gives it to him. Wu Tianming refuses, saying it's too much and he can't take it. The bald person comes closer and asks if he's really willing to give them this divine pill. 
Lin Mu replies that's right and thinks that it looks like they've understood the value of this pill, and for someone who lives every day on the edge, nothing is more important than their lives. Lin Mu perceives from their greedy eyes that they can handle this job. Wu Qianming requests a private conversation with him. Lin Mu agrees, asking what the matter is. Wu Qianming mentions the crowded surroundings and suggests finding another place to talk. They move to an inner passageway. Wu Tianming observes Lin Mu's strength and questions why he doesn't take over this territory for himself, wondering why he is seeking help from others. Lin Mu apologizes, stating that he's not interested in this matter and doesn't want to be involved. Wu Tianming acknowledges Lin Mu's stance, noting that he doesn't hold them in high regard. However, since Lin Mu has approached them, it implies that he needs help from individuals like them because he can't assign the task to anyone else. Lin Mu urges him to get straight to the point and stop beating around the bush. Wu Tianming cuts to the chase, expressing his desire to no longer work under others. He reveals that he has been part of the underground world for many years and wants a change. He explains that he has let his brothers down, and Lin Mu's appearance is the perfect opportunity for them to turn their fate around. Meanwhile, he asks for his help in establishing his own gang. Wu Tianming agrees, explaining that a direct confrontation with the opposition would result in losses for all of them. He hopes that Lin Mu can stand on his side and support him from behind. Lin Mu reiterates that he has already clarified that he doesn't want to be part of this. Wu Tianming corrects him, stating that he doesn't need to do anything actively. He will find a way to confront the opposition. Once he succeeds, Lin Mu can request anything from him anytime, and he will fulfill it. Lin Mu realizes that Wu Tianming wants to use his name to intimidate others. If he doesn't clarify the truth, no one will know, and Wu Tianming expresses his respect for this approach. Lin Mu, satisfied that he doesn't have to help actively, tells Wu Qianming not to look for him unless it's important. Wu Qianming expresses gratitude, saying that's great, while Lin Mu walks away, adding that he'll be clear about not being contacted unless it's for something significant. Wu Qianming thanks him. The scene shifts to Lin Mu's place at night, where he arrives home and announces that he's back. Miss Song Yuru inquires why he is home so late. He explains that after the audition, he went to look for a few friends, and before he knew it, it was already this late. Zai Roman 11 asks him about the audition and if he got the role. He confirms that he got it and now just needs to wait for their call. She hugs him, expressing joy and stating that it's great. She knew he would make it, and she believes her idol has good taste. Xuan Rong remarks to Zai Roman 11 that he has changed quickly and recalls someone imagining things in the afternoon. Zai Roman 11 becomes irritated and instructs them not to listen to Xuan Rong. Although Xuan Rong may be Yao Zian Zian's fan, Zai Roman 11 warns that if she dares to have funny ideas about her, she won't let her get away with it. Lin Mu intervenes, telling Zai Roman 11 she's imagining things and Xuan Rong just wants to do her job well. Zai Roman 11 responds emotionally, saying it's just been a day, and he's already starting to defend her. She starts crying, claiming that his heart has been stolen and he doesn't want them anymore. The scene shifts to Green Lotus Mountain, where Yan Lang she exclaims to Hong Ling Sheng that they meet again and rushes to hug him. Hong Ling Sheng reciprocates the hug, expressing how long it's been and how much he has missed him. He jokes about the strangeness of missing a man and questions if he has turned gay. Lang she responds that he doesn't know if it's him he's missing or the thing he has. Hong Ling Sheng asserts that he knows him the best, even though his parents bore and raised him. He then introduces Lin Tian Nan, an incredible guy from the capital, on holiday. Lin Tian Nan shakes hands with Yan Lang Shi, humbly stating that Hong's compliment is too much and that he's just normal. Yan Lang she disagrees, affirming that there's no need to be humble, as he could tell from the first time he saw him that he's somebody important. Hong Ling Sheng expresses his longing for Fragrant Abode's most famous tea. Yan Lang she invites them to follow him, and Hong Ling Sheng agrees. They all reach Green Lotus Mountain, specifically Fragrant Abode. 
Meanwhile, Yan Lang she mentions fragrant abodes tea, noting that everyone in the Eastern Sea has heard about it, and brother Lin Tian Nan is in luck today. Lin Tian Nan responds, expressing his excitement about trying it. Xiao Fan approaches and asks if they are here for tea appreciation. Yan Lang she confirms, and she invites them to follow her, leading them inside the restaurant where someone is enjoying tea, commenting on its wonderful taste. Lin Tian Nan observes everyone's happy faces and expresses his eagerness also to try the tea. Hong Ling Shang suggests they try the tea today. Xiao Fan inquires about their tea preferences. Fragrant Abode's boss, Zhu Yu, arrives and recognizes Hong Ling Sheng and Yan Lang Shi, greeting them and expressing how long it has been since they last met. Hong Ling Sheng compliments Zhu Yu, stating that it's been a year, and she's still as youthful and beautiful as ever, to which she smiles. Yan Lang Shi says they miss the tea here, so they've come to disturb her. Zhu Yu replies that both of them are still sweet talkers, urging them to chat first, as the tea will be served soon. After enjoying tea, they all come out, and Lin Tian Nan shares that he noticed something incredible at Fragrant Abode. Yan Lang Shi and Hong Ling Sheng inquire about what he observed. He responds that while the tea at Fragrant Abode is good, the boss is even better. Yan Lang Shi remarks on his sharp senses, noting that it took him only a while to notice the subtle workings of that place. Lin Tian Nan recalls Zhu Yu, describing her as having a sexy body and a queen-like demeanor, something quite rare. Hong Ling Sheng jokes if he has fallen for her, and Lin Tian Nan confirms, expressing admiration for her outstanding figure and looks, admitting that he can't stop thinking about her now. Hong Ling Sheng suggests that since they've rarely met up, they should find a place to catch up, and Yan Lang she agrees, mentioning he had the same idea. Xi Roman 11 quickly parks the car and comes out, stating it took her 10 minutes and 43 seconds as if she has set a new record. Lin Mu also exits the car, complaining that her driving is too ferocious, making him feel dizzy and nauseous. Meanwhile, Yan Lang she notices Lin Mu and asks if it isn't Lin Mu, wondering if he's still alive. Hong Ling Sheng inquires if the pretty girl over there is his friend. Lin Mu annoyingly responds that he doesn't know her and suggests they go, thinking they will see how much longer his luck can last. On the other hand, Lin Mu also sees Yan Lang Shi and thinks it's young master Yan Lang Shi who once wanted him dead. He decides to wait and see, determined to make him pay for it sooner or later. Xi Roman 11 asks why he is spacing out, urging him to move. He replies that it's nothing and agrees to go asking if this is the place she is talking about. Besides the serene surroundings, he sees nothing else that's special about it. Xi Roman 11 laughs and explains that Fragrant Abode is the best place to have tea in the whole of the Eastern Sea, attracting many visitors who often can't even get a chance to taste the tea there. Lin Mu expresses his anticipation of seeing if it's as good as she claims. Xiao Fan welcomes them and informs Xi Roman 11 that Sister Zhu Yu is around. Xi Roman 11 greets Xiao Fan, mentioning it's been a long time, and she asks if Sister Zhu Yu is present. Xiao Fan confirms and directs them to the second floor. Lin Mu notes that it seems she is a regular here, as even the staff recognizes her. Xi Roman 11 explains that, of course, the boss of Fragrant Abode is her best friend. Zuyu, upon hearing her voice, questions why she is free to visit her today. Xi Roman 11 mentions she brought a friend to introduce to her. Lin Mu observes that Sister Zuyu seems to be a cultivator as well, but judging by her pale face and weak steps, he guesses she used too much of her kai recently. Xi Roman 11 asks why Zuyu looks so pale and questions if her brother-in-law is not well. Zhu takes a deep breath and suggests they not talk about it, revealing that his illness has been relapsing more frequently these days, and she has used all her kai to help him, but it hasn't been successful. Lin Mu greets Zhu Yu and introduces himself as Lin Mu. She responds that he looks extraordinary and Xi Roman 11 is a lucky person. Xi Roman 11 denies it, saying they're just friends, and she brought him here to try out the flower tea she has created. Zhu teases Xi Roman 11, calling her a bad friend who always eyes her flower tea, 
Xyroman 11 defends herself, claiming that Zhu Yu's flower tea is the best in the world. Zhu Yu amused, says she'll go prepare the tea and asks them to take a seat. Xyroman 11 thanks Zhu Yu, and they both take a seat. Lin Mu comments that Sister Zhu Yu is no ordinary person, questioning why she is willing to be stuck in a tea parlor here. Zhu Yu explains that she was already the boss of Fragrant Abode when she got to know Xyroman 11. Lin Mu guesses that she has used up a lot of her kai, assuming her husband's condition isn't too good. Ziyu confirms that, for the past few years, she has been using her kai to suppress her husband's strange illness, and it seems like her kai isn't going to work any longer. Lin Mu asks about the illness and wonders if there isn't anyone in the world who can cure it. Meanwhile, Ziyu explains that if they could find the divine doctor, Mu Ran King, they might have been able to save her husband. However, in such a big world, it's challenging to locate him. Lin Mu wonders who Mu Ran King is and recalls that he is Zhu Si Yun's Shifu. He considers if Mu Ran King's abilities could cure her husband's strange illness. He realizes that Mu Ran King has the capability, but he becomes concerned, thinking someone is attacking Sister Zhu Yu. A fellow disciple of Lian Cheng enters and informs Zhu Yu that they have finally seized the opportunity. He suggests that she must have expended considerable effort on Kai Lian Chen's injury. Ziyu falls to the floor and admits that if she hadn't used up her Kai recently, the two of them would have been no match for her. The fellow disciple acknowledges that he may not be as strong as she is, but winning isn't always about strength, it's about intelligence. Zai Roman 11 and Lin Mu rush towards Ziyu, expressing concern for her well-being. Ziyu urges them to leave immediately and not come closer. Zai Roman 11 becomes enraged, vowing not to let anyone who harmed sister Ziyu go unpunished. Shitty dismisses the use of big words, suggesting that, in that case, they shouldn't leave and all of them will stay there. Ziyu challenges them, telling them to bring it on as she prepares for the fight. Shitty decides to settle it with her first, and she responds with a defiant attitude, bringing it on. Lin Mu, noticing the impending punch, intervenes and stops Shitty's attack. Shitty is confused, asking what's going on, while Lin Mu throws him away, stating that he can't be so rude to a lady. Zuyu, attempting to get up, is impressed by Lin Mu's strong Kai. She didn't expect him to be such a highly skilled master, realizing that he defeated Shitty in one move. Lian Chang's Shixing demands an explanation asking how he dared to harm his friend and insisting that he pay with his life. Lian Cheng's Shixing throws needles toward Lin Mu, declaring that he's dead meat. Ziyu shouts a warning, mentioning that there's poison on the needles. Lin Mu quickly creates a shield around himself and remarks that pretty tricks won't work. He confidently blocks the incoming needles with his magical shield. Zuyu, impressed, think he's so young, but able to manipulate his Kai to such an extent. Lin Mu retaliates by returning the needles to Lian Cheng's Shixing, and they stick to his face, causing him to fall down. He urgently tries to open the antidote bottle but struggles. Frustrated, he urges himself to hurry up and open it. Zuyu intervenes, throwing the bottle away, and asserts that people like him don't deserve to live in this world, he can go to hell. The assailant, still defiant, attempts to say something, but is cut off as Zuyu declares she won't let him off even in death. Zai Roman 11 checks on Zuyu, asking if she's alright. Zuyu assures her that she's fine, just suffering from minor internal injuries and will recover after a few days of rest. Meanwhile, Lin Mu inquires about the origin of the two attackers. Zuyu explains that they are Lian Cheng's Shixing and Shitty. Zai Roman 11 expresses surprise, asking if they are his Lian Cheng's Shixing and Shitty. Ziyu confirms it and reveals that they've harbored evil thoughts since Lian Cheng was the only one to receive their Shifu's actual teachings. She explains that they attacked him in the middle of his cultivation, causing his Kai to be in disarray and he almost died from it. Zai Roman 11 condemns them, stating that they are despicable and deserve to die. Ziyu further explained that Lian Cheng decided to forgive them since they were from the same sect, but they refused to let go of the grudge, which has persisted until now. Xyroman 11 and Lin Mu assist Ziyu, taking her to her room. 
Lin Mu suggests that they likely sneaked in to attack her, knowing that she was currently in a weak state. Zhu confirms this, mentioning that Lian Cheng's Kai is becoming restless each day and she won't be able to suppress it much longer. Zai Roman 11 inquires if Zhu still don't have any news about the divine doctor Mu Ran King. Zhu refused to acknowledge any news. Lin Mu interjects, stating that she doesn't have to look anymore as Dr. Tiza Mu has passed away for more than 10 years. Zai Roman 11 reacts strongly, shouting at him not to say such rubbish, insisting that Dr. Minian Mu is in seclusion and they'll definitely be able to find him. Zhu Yu reveals that she had suspected this for a long time since there was no news about him for such an extended period. Zai Roman 11 encourages Zhu not to give up, stating that even if they can't find the Divine Doctor, there must be other ways to save her brother-in-law. Zhu expresses gratitude for her kind words and mentions that, based on what she knows, only Dr. Mu's inch of radiance would be able to save Lian Cheng. Lin Mu responds, telling Zhu Yu that just because the Divine Doctor has passed away doesn't mean that his techniques are lost as well.